So somebody, you know, is overweight, obese, wherever they're at along that spectrum, tuning into this today, and they're going to, you know, they're in a busy lifestyle right now. They don't have tons of extra time. What would you say to them to give them the biggest bang for their buck when it comes to weight loss? Uh, I mean, three things. I'll give you four things, uh, but they're all easy. One is more challenging than the other because it requires more structure. So here's your, here's your four steps that will result in cons- consistent, progressive, sustainable fat loss and will get you pretty close. Some people will get them all the way, but pretty close to a healthy body weight, okay? So a nice, generally healthy body weight, okay? Here they are. Hit your protein targets, the ones that I mentioned earlier, about a 0.8 to 1 gram per pound of target body weight. So if you need to lose 50 pounds to get to your target body weight, use that as your guide, okay? So target body weight in protein and grams, prioritize that. So that's number one. Uh, Avoid heavily processed foods. That's number two. Heavily processed foods make you overeat, period, end of story. They're engineered to do so. And if you eat them, you will eat more it'll be very difficult. So if you avoid them, you'll naturally eat the right amount. Okay, you're much more likely to eat the right amount. So those, so those are the two dietary things. Number three, strength train. Okay, at least once a week, ideally twice a week, but at least once a week. Do some form of strength training and try and get stronger progressively over time. And then here's the fourth one, number four. Walk after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's it. If you just did those things consistently, by the way, if that's too much, that's okay. Start with one or two of them, do that until it becomes consistent, then add the next one, okay? But if you just did those four things, if everybody watching, listening to me, did just those four things, they would all get pretty close, if not all the way to their ideal, I should say, uh, healthy body weight. When it comes to burning fat and getting to that ideal body weight, there's two different layers to that. There's the person that needs to actually do what you just said and get there. And then there's maintaining that over the long term. Yeah. So working with people over the years, how often do you see people who do get to their goal, put that weight back on, you know, two, three beyond years down the line? Well, God, uh, the data is clear on that. Uh, 90 plus percent of people gain the weight back. Now, people who do it right, People who do it in a way to where they develop a good relationship with it, um, they it's not hating life. They do it in a sustainable way where it integrates into their life. They're not working out well beyond what's necessary. They're not starving themselves or eating in unsustainable ways, right? So people who do it the right way, your success right now is much higher, much, much, much higher. I mean, towards the end of my career, I got really good at this. Uh, where um, a good, I mean, a majority of my clients would would really develop these behaviors and then that was it. It was what they did for the rest of their life. So it's possible if you do it the right way. If you do it the wrong way, it's almost impossible. For somebody that's tuned into this point, maybe they're doing very little or no resistance training at this, at this point in time, but they're going to begin and they want to get some basic equipment to start to do the basics at home. Yeah. What would you recommend them getting? And what's a couple exercises they could do to get the ball rolling and get that inertia moving? Yeah, so uh, a pair of adjustable dumbbells is inexpensive and nothing gives you the variety uh, of movement and the ability to do pretty much anything for any body. So adjustable dumbbells and a bench that's adjustable. Or you can get, if you want to take it back even further, even more expensive, easier to store, resistance bands. Okay, so stretchy bands. Or you can get a suspension trainer, the ones that hang from your doorway with the handles. Uh, Exercises, very basic. Some kind of a squatting movement. Some kind of a pressing movement. Some kind of a pulling or rowing movement. Some kind of an overhead movement. And then something that involves rotation. And what you might want to start doing is practice two of them a little bit every day. You can start like that. Hey, 10 minutes, I'm going to do, I'm going to practice a squatting movement and a pressing movement. That's all I'm going to do. Or you can do something more structured. I offer three different types of workouts in the Resistance Training Revolution book. Um, And it starts all the way from no equipment 
to having a basic gym set up at home. So, and everything in between. So you could, and in there, I give you structured workouts uh, that you would do two days a week. And we'll tie this back to the discipline piece. You want to pick something you're going to do for a lifetime, something you can build that inertia on and uh, yes. start small, you know, life's a long journey, build that momentum and form something that you're going to have for life. 100%. You could, I couldn't have said it better. Exactly. If you're enjoying the episode, take a second and let me know by clicking like and subscribe below. Thank you so much. And now back to the episode. So for somebody who's tuned into this point and their ears are perked and they're thinking about starting some resistance training, maybe at this point they're doing none or very little. Let's talk about some of the benefits people get when they start to do that on a regular basis and put muscle on their frame. Yeah. What advantages are they going to get? Oh man, muscle is is probably, I would say, the most protective. When you look at the context of the health issues or chronic health ills that uh, we suffer from in modern societies, muscle is the most protective tissue that we have for a few reasons. One, um, one of the biggest uh, health issues that we deal with from a longevity standpoint from everything to heart disease to uh, cancer and um, mental issues, including brain uh, degeneration type issues, the our ability to have really, really good, or should I say, uh, to remain sensitive to our insulin levels, to, to be able to utilize glucose well is paramount. It's paramount, right? Developing insulin insensitivity or since or, or incident insulin resistance before you can even tell on a test where the doctor says, oh, you're pre-diabetic. I mean, it happens a good five to 10 years before that. You start to see signs if you're really close enough. Uh, that right there is tied to so many chronic health issues. One of the best things you could do to offset that or buffer yourself against that is to build muscle. Muscle is extremely insulin sensitive, very, very insulin sensitive to the point where there's studies uh, on the severely obese where they don't even have them lose any weight. I'm talking about people who are like 60, 70 pounds overweight or more. They just haven't built a little bit of muscle. And you see significant improvements in insulin resistance. Muscle is insulin sensitive and muscle serves as a storage vessel for glycogen. Glycogen is what your body makes from sugar or glucose or carbohydrates. Okay. So when you have, when you eat something with sugar or glucose, and you've got that, you know, or, you know, or carbohydrates, and you've got that glucose circulating in your blood, insulin goes up, and then it shuttles glucose into storage vessels, the liver being the main one, and then the rest is muscle. Big muscles, or bigger muscles, I should say, have more of a capacity. So it just sucks up that glucose. So you get incredible um, insulin sensitivity effects from that. You also get a metabolic boost from building muscle. Muscle is uh, calorie expensive. It costs a lot of calories for your body to maintain muscle. Building a little bit of muscle will speed up your metabolism. Now, why is that important? Well, um, if you have a faster metabolism today, you are far less likely to be obese and far less likely to suffer the health consequences of obesity. Like if I could snap my fingers and speed up everybody's metabolism by 10 to 15%, we would probably solve, in a large effect, the obesity epidemic. Because you're just burning more calories sitting there, right? Versus having to move more to burn those calories, which is a very ineffective approach. You're burning more calories just sitting there. So you have a faster metabolism. The other uh, benefit is the uh, are the um, hormonal effects that the muscle building process encourages. Just to build muscle, just trying to build muscle, your body has to organize its hormones in a way to do so. In other words, the part of the muscle building process is your body taking its hormones and moving them and shifting them so that they sick, that they, they can fuel or drive this muscle building process. Well, what does that look like? You're more sensitive to insulin. I said that earlier. You're more sensitive to testosterone. You actually upregulate what are called androgen receptors. So the receptors that testosterone attaches to, well, you get more of them. So now your normal testosterone becomes super testosterone. Your testosterone also raises. This is both in men and women. By the way, women listening right now, testosterone 
is just as important for them as it is for men. They just have lower amounts. Low testosterone in women uh, produces the same negative effects in women that it does in men. Low libido, low energy, low drive, low motivation, brain fog, that kind of stuff. So you just get better testosterone response and levels. You get a balancing of estrogen and progesterone uh, in both men and women. But for women, this is extremely important. You get healthier growth hormone levels. This is the youth hormone and regular and the receptors that growth hormone attaches to also upregulate, meaning you have more of these um, receptors. Cortisol becomes more appropriate. So you're supposed to have cortisol that comes up in the morning, comes down at night. More muscle com promotes that. So you don't have the kind of inverse, which a lot of people have low cortisol in the morning. They got to take a bunch of caffeine to wake up. And then at night, cortisol spikes because of stress or whatever, dysfunction, then they can't sleep. Um, so it kind of reverses that. So your energy throughout the day, you get tired at night when the cortisol goes down, you become healthier. Um, muscle is so protective, in fact, that is uh, strongly correlated to uh, anti-cancer effects. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll share a study with you. That's quite remarkable. So I'm going to use a very unhealthy population just to prove a point. When you look at athletes, high-level athletes, high-level athletes in all sports are not the epitome of health, okay? Contrary to popular belief, a pro football player, basketball player, uh, you know, pro bodybuilder, these are not the healthiest people in the world. Their, their, their job, their goal is to, to just perform at the highest level, and they compromise and sacrifice their health in order to do so. In fact, pro, pro football players have a lower life expectancy than the average American because of the damage that they incur playing their sport and the, to the, the extremes that they push the body. Well, pro bodybuilders, another great example, they're not healthy. These people push their bodies to the limit with their training, diet, lifestyle, plus they add a bunch of drugs to the regimen to try to just build these in, insanely grotesque you know, bodies with crazy amounts of muscle. And uh, they're not they're not healthy for all intents. Anybody who knows the sport knows how unhealthy they are. Now, here's what's weird. They suffer from cancer rates that are lower, significantly lower than the average American. How's that possible? I mean, they're really beating their bodies up and they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff when it comes to performance enhancing drugs. Yet their, their, their cancer rates are significantly lower. That's because muscle is so anti-cancer that it actually... Uh, not only does it negate the poor health choices that they make, they actually have an anti-cancer effect. Muscle is so anti-cancer, it's remarkable. It's actually one of the, you can lower your all cause, your all across the board cancer risk by 20 to 25 to 50% just by having a more muscular physique. And that means you could do anything else. You don't have to change anything else. You just have more muscle on your body. So it's uh, pretty more remarkable. Um, Strength is one of the best predictors of all-cause mortality. So they, they've they done studies. Well, they do a strength test, a grip test. So it's, there's nothing, by the way, special about grip strength rather, other than it's a proxy for overall body strength. So if I have strong grip, probably means I have a strong body. I have a good amount of muscle on my body. Um, a, a grip strength test is a better predictor of all-cause mortality than BMI. It's a better predictor of all-cause mortality than almost any other single metric. So um, you you want muscle on your body. You want to try to build that muscle. It also it just makes being lean a lot easier because of the faster metabolism. So this is what most people need to aim for. They should train in a way to build muscle, feed their bodies in order to do so, and that'll help them be leaner, stay leaner, and improve their longevity. And it doesn't require as much time in the gym as, let's say, training for stamina and endurance. All right. A lot to get into there. That was powerful. I want to start with the cancer piece. So you mentioned the fact that these bodybuilders, even though they're doing all sorts of things that are unhealthy to their body, oftentimes have a less rate of cancer because of the muscle. Talk about the physiology there. What's happening? It's an interesting, it's a very interesting question. So as far as I know, and as deep as I've gone into it, because this is something that we're still learning from, there are anti-cancer compounds that are released and produced by muscle. So muscle is kind of like this counter to the proliferative effects of cancer cells. It's like a check and balance. It may also have to do with the mitochondrial health 
that building muscle um, promotes. So mitochondria, uh, obviously, you know, the common saying is it's the engine of the cell. Mitochondrial dysfunction seems to be a role, seems to play a very significant role in both cancer cell um, from, uh, formation and proliferation. Building muscle is a phenomenal way to maintain mitochondrial health. So you may also have to do with that. And then I mentioned the insulin sensitizing effects. Um, being uh, Having insulin resistance uh, is closely connected to many different types of cancers. This is why obesity is a cancer risk, probably. Probably one of the reasons why. So it could be all three of those things, but we do know that muscle ha is in incredibly anti-cancer. That's as far as we know now. But I do find it interesting, right, that I, I didn't expect to find that with bodybuilders. I thought, I mean, bodybuilders are pushing hormones into their body at such crazy rates. You would think they would have higher cancer rates because certain hormones, especially if cancer is present, can drive cancer. Um, and yet here they sit, here they are sitting at with significantly lower um, cancer rates. They also, I mean, building muscle also um, amplifies uh, mTOR, mammalian target rapamycin. This is a signaler of muscle growth. Well, I mean, if you expose cancer cells to mTOR, they grow. So you would think that building muscle, you know, sending all these like growth factors that would cause cancer cells to proliferate, but the opposite is true. Um, so it's it's pretty interesting. It's very interesting, in fact. But yeah, the data is pretty pretty clear on this. No science behind this, but what pops into my head too is the fact that because you have muscle and that's regulating blood glucose and bringing insulin down, insulin is a growth hormone, so you're going to naturally have that lowered by having more muscle which cancer is growth out of control. So maybe there's some connection there. Could be um, because insulin itself, you know, I'm always, a, I'm always careful with, you, you know, what's interesting with cancer is that um, things that would be okay in a healthy context could also drive cancer in an unhealthy context. So protein, right? High protein diet, very healthy. If you have a tumor, eating too much, eating a lot of protein may actually drive or fuel the growth of the tumor cells. Same thing with carbohydrates and even fats. Even fats, although ketogenic diets seem to be anti-cancer, there are certain cancers that thrive in a ketogenic environment. Testosterone, right? Having good, healthy, high testosterone levels, very good for men uh, in particular. Like it's anti-cancer, it's anti-heart disease, it's anti-Alzheimer's and dementia, but let's say you have a testosterone sensitive cancer like prostate cancer. Well, if you have high testosterone, it could fuel that, you know, now developing cancer. So it's interesting. I think you're going somewhere though, because I don't know if insulin itself is pro cancer, but if your insulin levels are so high because your body's so desensitized, there may be a point with too where too much insulin then spills over and starts to drive strange behaviors in the body, right? So there may be something there. My other point of curiosity, as you explain all that too, with the bodybuilders and cancer is you wonder how much longevity those people have in general. How long are they living? Not great. To get cancer. Oh, right. You know, because of how, how much muscle mass they have on and how unnatural that is. And again, some of the things that they're likely taking to get to that point and maintaining it if they're not living as long as the rest of us, maybe they're getting less cancer as well. Great question, but their life expectancy is the same as the average person's. Okay, just so, just yeah. A so be, yeah, no, I thought the same thing. But the life expectancy of of bodybuilders, uh, competitive bodybuilders, is right in line, which isn't great, by the way. Um, it's right in line with the average American. Now, um, so you say, well, they have lower cancer risk. Why are they Why are they you know living as long as the average person? They have much higher rates of uh, heart disease uh, and kidney and liver issues, probably due to the drugs that they use. So again, they're not a healthy population. I just found it fascinating that uh, that they had such lower such low cancer rates in comparison, and it, it's it's the muscle. Well, while we're on the longevity piece, let's talk about muscle and longevity as a whole. So for somebody that that is one of their goals, they want to live a long life and prolong that. Why do they want to make sure they're putting on muscle as a piece of that? Well, besides all the reasons that I said earlier, which are all very important, the other reason is 
you know, one of the the common, one of the um, top causes of mortality as we get older is loss of function and mobility. It's not talked about enough, right? We know cancer, we know heart disease, but in the top five is bone loss, sarcopenia, and I can't move and I fall and I hurt myself and then my health really takes a dive. Anybody who's ever worked with the elderly population, I, you know, when I used to train people towards the end of my career, this became kind of a niche market that I started really training a lot of, right? So I, at one point I trained a lot of doctors, then they started sending me their client, their patients, and many of these patients were 65 and older, uh, a significant portion, at least a quarter of them were 70 and older. And um, as I'm training them and training the doctors, you know, learning about this, what's considered a special population. And um, there was a saying that I heard the surgeon say that I thought was crazy, but it's true. They said, in that population, there's a saying that we have in the hospital, which is, um, you know, grandma broke her hip and then died of pneumonia, right? So it's like when you're in your 70s and you're not very strong because you've lost lots of mobility. You have trouble getting up and down out of a chair. You're, it's hard for you to reach to a tall place to grab something. You need help balancing at times. You're afraid of falling. Maybe you use a cane or a walker. You fall down and you hurt yourself. Your health declines dramatically from that loss of mobility. I mean, it's, it's really crazy. And I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand. I had a client who broke her leg falling out of, um, or coming out of the, uh, shower. And so she couldn't train with me for a while because she had a broken leg and her mental health, it, it, it accelerated so fast in a four month period. It was like, uh, it was like five years. It was crazy. It was insane. She was already dealing with kind of low level dementia by the time I started training her. When she broke her leg and I saw her maybe four or five months later, she almost didn't recognize me. It was really terrifying at how fast her health declined. So loss of mobility, loss of freedom, loss of independence, and then the potential consequences of falls uh, is, is huge. And so that's on top of all the other stuff that I said. And when it comes to resistance training, we've been talking about it from the perspective of putting on muscle. But as you're talking about these people breaking bones... Let's talk about that whole aspect, because I think oftentimes in the health and wellness space, when people are looking to put on bone density or maintain it, they think about calcium supplements. Yeah. And let's talk about if somebody comes to you with that as being a concern as they're aging, what you'd say to them. Yeah. Well, look, if I'm trying to build a house, I definitely need wood and concrete and screws and nails, um, you know, and all the raw materials. But if I don't have the workers there, and if I don't have the instructions, then it's just going to sit there. All that, all those materials are just going to sit in a big pile, and nothing's going to happen. Okay. So yeah, your body needs nutrients to to strengthen and build bone, so calcium and vitamin D and magnesium and so on. But if there's no signal to build and strengthen bone, it doesn't do anything. In fact. Uh, taking a lot of calcium without sending the signal to build and strengthen bone can actually result in worse health. You can develop calcium deposits in your arteries and lots of other problems. By the way, taking those nutrients when you don't have a nutrient deficiency is also a waste of time also. Okay, so people are like, oh, calcium, I need that for strong bones. If you don't have a calcium deficiency, taking calcium is not going to do anything. Okay. Now, what tells my body directly? What can I do to tell my body directly to strengthen bone. Like, what can I do? Um, use resistance, strength training. Nothing tells the bones to strengthen like handling heavy resistance. Fact, nothing. Nothing will directly tell your bones to build like strength training. Muscle, tendon, ligament, I mean, it all anchors in bone. The same stress that builds muscle will build bone. And studies will show this very clearly. Nothing improves bone density like strength training. Nothing comes close. Cardiovascular training doesn't come close. Flexibility training doesn't come close. Swimming doesn't come close. Strength training is a direct uh, signal. It's direct information. It's direct directions. Build and strengthen. And then if you have the adequate nutrients, right, you don't have a nutrient deficiency, well, now your body's going to build bone. And you'll see it. You'll see it. Go measure your bone density. Start strength training. Go back six months later. 
take a bone density test, watch what happens. You, you and your doctor will both be shocked. For somebody who is, say, in their mid-60s and they're taking this in right now and they've been neglectful of resistance training and, and say their muscle mass right now is, is pretty pitiful and, and so is their bone density, mm-hmm. how much of a chance do they have at building that up at that age? Your body- because you hear a lot about maintenance, especially when it comes to muscle mass. Like you got you to gotta build it up and then maintain it. Yeah. But I've heard specifically, again, to the muscle mass piece, a lot of grim information about people rebuilding that when they're older. Yeah, your body never loses its ability to adapt. Now, the potential can be reduced as you get older. Like your your your, your ultimate strength potential is going to be lower at 75 than it would be at 25, okay? But your body will always adapt. Uh, the second you lose the ability to adapt, you die. Because that's so the body has those mechanisms that are in place. So can you strengthen bone and muscle in those ages? Yes, absolutely, definitely to the point where you're healthy. You know, you may not become a, a a champion, you know, weightlifter. You may not be able to press your body weight overhead, but you could definitely get to a point where you're you're healthy and you feel good. So that that um that is a a terrible message that people can receive or believe and it prevents them from doing the, the one thing that can so significantly positively impact their health. It's really, you know, it's really terrible. So no, I, the, I'll tell you what, the most profound changes that I've ever seen from a lifestyle perspective in clients were in people over the age of 65. Fact. Okay. You give me a 35 year old, and yeah, they become more fit, they become stronger, they feel better. And that's profound. I don't want to take anything away from that. But I take a 70-year-old who has trouble going up the stairs and in three months can now go up the stairs without holding onto the railing comfortably. That's profound. That's life-changing. You know, I, I, I've told this story many times. I had this one woman I trained who was in her late 70s and she hired me, or her daughter, I should say her daughter hired me to train her mom. And we would work out once a week together. And I don't remember how long this was. It was probably, I don't know, seven months, six, seven months or something down the line. We'd been training consistently once a week. And I remember she walked into my studio. I used to have this small, like one-on-one studio for trainers and coaches and all that. And she walked in one day and I was with another client and I thought I had made a mistake on the schedule. So I saw her and I said, oh my gosh, it said, you know, I don't think we have a session scheduled. And she said, no, no, no. She's like, "I, I just wanted to come in here and tell you I was next door grocery shopping and the, you know, I had the, the, the bagger load my car for me. And without thinking, I reached up, grabbed my trunk and pulled it down. She says, I haven't been able to do that in 10 years. I haven't been able to reach up far enough to grab my trunk and pull it down and close my trunk. I didn't even think about it. I grabbed it, pulled it down. And then I sat there and I couldn't believe that I was able to do that. And I just had to come and tell you. Like that's profound. That is a massive change in your lifestyle, you know, or or being able to get up and down off the couch. I mean, that's uh, that's incredible. So, yeah, no, you're you're going to see bigger lifestyle changes and improvements in advanced age than you would when you're younger. Now, your potential again may be lower, but I don't think a seven year old is exercising or going to start strength training right now with the intention of deadlifting, you know, twice their body weight. I think what they're doing is they're saying, I want to become healthier. I want to improve my longevity, my mobility. I want to feel a difference. And they will, they'll feel a significant difference. And another layer onto this, and we talked about this last time is muscle memory. So for somebody who used to work out, say in their twenties and thirties, they're not actually starting from ground zero. The muscles remember that previous build that they've had and it can come back easier. Yeah. If you were to, if you were to, let's say, train for an entire year and, and gain, let's say 10 pounds of lean body mass, which would be significant in a year uh, period. Um, and then let's say for whatever reason you lost it all, you would gain it back if you went back to training within a month or two. So what took you a year, you would gain back in let's say one tenth the time. Uh, that's, that's called muscle memory. It's well-documented. Um, it's, uh, if you've ever broken a limb, you've experienced it where you, you had to take a cast off your leg or your arm. And you look at your arm and like, oh my God, it's so skinny. Like there's no muscle. And then just through daily movement, your arm comes back to normal size in a very short period of time. 
So that's an adaptation evolutionary uh, process that we've had that we have. It's an ancient um, evolutionary, like I said, adaptation that we have, um, and it's remarkable. So, but I, also just of note, whatever you do to to get stronger, you need to do a fraction of what you did to keep it. It's pretty crazy. There's some studies that show that one ninth of the training uh, that you that it took to get to where you're at would be take would would be required to maintain. I mean, that just makes strength training so much more attractive, I think. It's like, okay, you know, once I get there, well, to keep it, it's so much easier. And I can miss workouts and, you know, I lose the activity, you know, get me wrong. There's benefits that you'll lose, but the muscle strength and muscle mass itself, it sticks around. That's encouraging. And for somebody tuning into this and say they are in that bracket of, you know, 60 plus years old, they haven't taken this stuff we're talking about seriously today, resistance training to this point, and they want to start today. How effective is just using body weight oh. and, and putting on the muscle and getting a lot of these benefits we've been talking about? Yeah, let me be very clear. Resistance training or strength training, all it is is a form of exercising using some form of resistance, which can be body weight. It could be a stretchy band. It could be, uh, of course, free weights or machines. All it is is using some type of resistance in a way to build strength and build muscle. That's it. So what does that look like? Okay, I, I mentioned the tools that you can use, body weight, resistance bands, uh, machines, free weights. What does that mean to use them in a way to build strength and muscle? Um, you do reps and you rest in between sets. Okay, so it's not going from one exercise to another nonstop and I'm sweating and breathing hard. That's endurance training. That's not what I'm talking about. It's lifting something or doing something for, let's say, 10 motions, 10 repetitions with a sufficient intensity. Uh, and that's based off of your current fitness level. So again, if you're doing nothing, it doesn't require much at all. If you're very advanced, then it requires much more. And then you rest about a minute and then you repeat it. Now, why do you need to rest? In order to build strength, we have to train the strength system known as the anaerobic energy system. And if I don't rest and I go from exercise to exercise to exercise, I train the aer I train the aerobic system, which doesn't build much strength and muscle, just builds stamina and endurance. So I do a set, I sit down, I wait a minute, literally 60 seconds or two minutes or three minutes, and then I repeat it again. I got to train the strength system. That's it. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. And when it comes to basic movements, again, we're talking in the newbie here, somebody that's just beginning. Yeah. What is, say, a handful of different movements that they want to incorporate to work the whole body? Oh, God. You don't need to do very many. And there's variations of the ones I'm about to say, but it's very simple. You need to do some kind of a squatting movement, okay? There's a lot of variations, but a body weight squat would qualify. Some kind of a pressing movement, so a push-up or all the push-up push -up variations, including pushing up against the wall. If that, you know, That's a very regressed version if, I, if I'm just getting started or pressing something overhead, okay? Some kind of a pulling movement. So a row would be good. A pull down or a pull up would be good in more advanced um, you know, circles. And then something that involves rotation. Uh, so rotating with a band or rotating with a cable or a weight just to strengthen that kind of rotating movement. And then if you want to add something else, something that strengthens the core directly, a floor crunch would be just fine. That's it. I mean, you're, you're set right there. Now you could do a lot of variations, right? So I mentioned squats. So you could do a squat. You could do a, a lunge. You could do a walking lunge. You could do a step up. There's like a lot of different variations of that. You know, a row, a pull down, different types of rows for the pulling, pressing. There's lots. But that's it. Those basic things that I said, if you did something that kind of fell in each of those categories every day, you know, every time I should say you exercise, you'd be set. I think it's important we're getting into this on such a simple level for the beginner because yeah, it can be so intimidating. If somebody's tuning into the video and looking at your size right now and and there's so much information out there in the complex realm, which is necessary too for the people that are at that level. But I find, well, I know my audience, a lot of them are older and they're older males. Yeah. And they've probably never taken this on to a serious point. So I think it's important we're getting to the nuts and bolts here and giving them hope. Again, a lot of them maybe have heard that 
There's no sense in starting to exercise later in life. I can't really do much at that point. We're giving people hope and we're giving people the necessary info to get started. Yeah, it's um remember the right dose will get you there that will get you the best results. And if you're not doing anything now, it doesn't take much. So if you're watching this right now and you haven't done strength training in a while or let's say ever, you could literally do some body weight squats. If that's too challenging for you, if your form isn't great, you're feeling your knees, you could just sit down and stand back up. That would be a squat. And do it in a way to where it doesn't hurt any joints. So slowly sit down, slowly stand up. If you need to raise the height of the chair, because sitting down it, you know, in a deep chair might be too difficult, that's fine. You can start, you could start there. So there's one movement. You could do where you stand up against the wall move your feet away against it, uh, uh, away from the wall, push your body, uh, let your body go to the wall, push your body away. There's your, there's your pressing movement. And then for your pulling movement, get yourself a, a stretchy resistance band, tie it around a doorknob, stand up or sit down, pull it back, pull the shoulders back so you feel the, the upper mid back kind of pulling back to give you that kind of good posture. You're training the back area. There's three exercises, you're done. Like that's your workout, right? You could do like one to three sets of each of those Stop right there. In a few days, try it again. As you get stronger, add a little bit more reps or intensity. And that's a great place to start. That'll, for the first two or three months, get you some good strength gains. So say, Sal, this is a day you're going to go and do a big workout. I'm curious, before the workout, what are you eating or are you eating? And then afterwards, even during the workout, are you bringing snacks that you're having to, you know, fuel up as you're, as you're pushing it? No, not necessary um, at all. Um, unless you're doing like a really long, grueling endurance type workout, um, f you know, eating while you work out uh, is not only not necessary, but uh, will probably hamper digestion and can cause uh, inflammatory issues and, and all that stuff. In fact, they find athletes, high, you know, high intensity athletes or athletes that train for long periods of time, and you know, they'll feed themselves with like carbohydrate drinks and glue and and you know what they call them goo and all that stuff. They find higher rates of things like um, intestinal wall hyperpermeability, inflammation, because overall inflammation goes up as you exercise. You're probably not a good idea to eat at the same time, unless you're at that level and you're balancing like performance and, and, and total health. But anyway, average person, no, you don't need to do that. But I will say this, before important things, it is a good idea to, to give yourself some space to prepare for that important thing. So you wouldn't go into a big meeting and just go into it. You would you would prepare for it, and then right before, maybe thirty minutes before, look at your notes, gather your thoughts, walk into that meeting, and then present a really really good meeting. Right. So, before your workout, it's a good idea to think about what you're going to do and your intention. You know, thirty minutes before. Thirty minutes, but you know, you have to stop what you're doing. But thirty minutes before, be like, okay, I'm going to go to the gym. You know, um, I'm feeling a little anxious right now. So I think my intention for the workout is to make myself feel more calm uh, or I'm a little stiff. So I'm going to go in there and try and really loosen things up or man, I got a lot of energy. I think I'm going to go for a, for a, you know, for a new weight PR on my exercises. I think I'm feeling good or whatever, but just have that intention and studies will show people tend to have better workouts. They tend to have better results when they do that. By the way, this is true for sleep. This is true for food. This is true uh, for when you come home from work, like you come home from work, pull into the driveway, pause for five minutes. I'm going to see my wife. I'm going to see my kids. What's my intention? Do I want to bring in the stress from work as I walk into you know, the front door um, before going to bed? You know, let me, let me prepare for sleep an hour before, put blue light blocking glasses on, dim the lights, um, not watch too much TV, or if I do wear those blue light blocking glasses, get myself calm, ready. So my brain and body is ready to go to sleep as soon as I, you know, kind of hit the pillow and don't waste an hour of that, for, you know, where my brain is trying to, uh, switch into that. You can do this before meals. Uh, in fact, I find this quite fascinating, but, um, almost every spiritual practice brings some form of mindfulness before meals, right? So traditionally you'll see prayer before meals. Um, it's a great practice. You don't have to pray, but it, but if you pause before you eat, and then bring awareness, like, um, I'm nourishing my body. Is this something that my body needs? Is this something that my mind and my soul need? Uh, am I taking care of myself right now? Just something short like that brings awareness to what you're about to do. You're less likely to overeat, more likely to, 
uh, to make better choices, more likely to eat in a way that's uh, nourishing. And this is true too when you have the occasional junk food and, and, and beer with your friends because you know maybe the value of that particular meal is to connect with your friends. Um, so you just you just that pause before uh, brings value to anything that's important, including your workout. Let's talk about after the workout. Are you somebody that likes to use like one of those shaker bottles with some protein powder to get the protein in the system right after a workout or, or have a big meal with a lot of protein? Or are you somebody yeah. that likes to take a break and, and fast for a bit after a workout before you feel up again? I'm just curious yeah, how you go about doing that. Yeah, there's a big myth that you need to eat uh, protein or carbohydrates right after your workout to speed up recovery or, or, or build more muscle. In fact, the, the supplement industry will call that the anabolic window. Um, and it was, it's a great selling tool because, you know, of course, if I'm going to eat right after my workout, well, I, I need something convenient. So let me buy your protein shake, right? No, no, you don't. You, I always tell people do what, what feels best. So some people are like, Oh, I, I like to eat afterwards. Okay. You can eat afterwards. Some people are like, I don't feel like eating for an hour afterwards. I just like to kind of wait a little bit and then eat. Okay. Then you're, you're fine either way. There is no, it, it doesn't make a difference. The only time it makes a difference are with high performing athletes who plan on working out again later in the day. So if you work out, you know, if there's like, there are athletes that'll train twice a day, right? You work out in the morning. You do want to fuel yourself right afterwards because you're going to expend energy again, you know, a few hours later. But for the average person, it makes no difference uh, whatsoever. Eat after, eat way after. It doesn't make a difference. Good to know. And what about supplements? We talked about protein powder there, which is kind of in a gray area of, I guess it could be considered a supplement depending who you talk to. But Sal, in a general sense, for somebody who is getting into resistance training, what are some supplements they might want to consider? And then more nuanced and specific around the workout, are there certain things people want to take to get the most out of the workout? Okay. So let's start with supplements. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you three, three, I'll, I'll rank three categories of supplements in terms of importance. Number one, if you have a nutrient deficiency, supplements can be a game changer. So if you, if you have a deficiency in vitamin D or magnesium or one of the B vitamins, those are the most common ones. Supplementing with those will change your life because those are essential nutrients. And if you don't have the right amount, your body is just not able to operate the, the way that it, it needs to. And you'll probably have symptoms like anxiety, depression, pain, whatever, right? So so you can get some very easy testing to see if you have uh, what your nutrient levels are. And then if you notice a deficiency in magnesium, supplement with it. Um, and it's, it's a game changer. By the way, I want to back out and say the best way to get your nutrients is through whole foods. Okay. But supplements can be quite convenient. So yeah, you can get, uh, you know, more vitamin D by eating like cod liver oil or something like that, or you could just take it right or get more sunlight. Okay. So that's number one, number two, protein powders. Here's why those can be quite valuable. Um, studies are very conclusive on this. A high protein diet is better for muscle building fat loss, satiety, and general health. Okay. It's just better. So if you want to be more satisfied with your diet, eat a high protein diet. If you want to be able to build more muscle, eat a high protein diet. If you want to burn body fat more effectively, eat a high protein diet. So what is high protein? About 0 0.6 to roughly one gram of protein per pound of body weight in normal weight individuals. If you're obese, use your lean body mass. So if you're a 150 pound male, you're looking at, I don't know, 90 to 150 grams of protein a day. Okay. Same thing for a woman, a hundred pound woman, you're looking at 60 to about hundred grams of protein a day, for example. So take your body weight, multiply it times 0 0.6 to one. And that's the range of, of upper limit benefits you'll get from high protein diet. Now, the challenge of that is it's hard to get that much protein for people. I mean, if I take a 130 pound woman and she's trying to eat 100 grams of protein, that's 33 grams of protein for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And protein is so, it, it produces so much satiety that she'll eat that 33 gram, you know, piece of meat or chicken or whatever. And then she'll be like, oh my God, I'm full. I can't, I can't eat anymore, right? So if that's a challenge to hit, 
a protein powder can be a very easy, convenient way of doing it. But again, um, ideally it comes from food. Okay. It's just a lot of people miss it because it's, it's, it can be challenging for some people, especially if you're a bigger male, you know, 200 grams of protein for a man, that's a lot of protein to eat. Right. So, so protein powders can be valuable if you're not hitting it with your food, with your whole food. All right. The third one also will provide value, but it's the least important creatine. Okay. Creatine is a, it is one of the most well-studied supplements in existence. There's literally thousands of human studies done on creatine. It's got tremendous wide-ranging benefits. It improves strength, energy, cognitive function, brain health, insulin sensitivity, heart health, uh, organ health. It's got antioxidant properties. It's good for the mitochondria of the cells. It is. It went from being a bodybuilder supplement in the in the mid '90s when it was first being sold, to now being something that you're going to start seeing, and you're already starting to see wellness, health people push and are actually starting to put it now in those like those meal replacement shakes that they give uh, people in, in um, you know, retirement homes. They're starting to add uh, creatine to them. It is uh, something that most people will derive health benefits from. Um, but you will notice a boost in, in athletic performance uh, when you take it. So that's it. Those are the three. All the other supplements out there, I mean – some can provide some benefits, some provide not benefit. And I'll tell you this much right now, even with the stuff that I just, except for the nutrient deficiency one, the, the first line, uh, a, a good diet, uh, good exercise routine, good sleep, nice lifestyle is 98.9% of the pie. You know, the 1.1% comes from supplements. So they don't make that big of a difference. Just if you want to get fancy. That's right. And Sal, it's not to, we're all different and we're all at different stages of life and have different goals. So it's not to copy exactly what you're doing, but what are you currently taking supplement wise right now on a daily basis? Yeah. You don't want to ask me that question because I have a bit of an interesting relationship with supplements. So this is, this is something I love supplements. I love messing with them. I love testing them. I obviously work for, uh, or I have uh, a fitness and health podcast, so they get sent to me all the time. So at any given moment, I'm testing and trying different supplements. But if I were to go down to my staples, it would be protein powder because I'm a 205 pound male. I aim for about 200 grams of protein a day. That can be hard to eat sometimes with my schedule. So protein powder, uh, creatine, um, I supplement with magnesium, vitamin D3, because those one, those ones tend to get depleted in me as when I do my nutrient testing. Um, and, uh, I think that would be it. There's really nothing else. I, I caffeine. There you go. There's another one. I like caffeine quite a bit. Like most people, it's one of my favorite, uh, my favorite drugs to use, I guess. So, um, but those, those would be the ones that I probably stick to. And when it comes to caffeine, is that something you intentionally have before doing resistance training and find you get more out of yeah. the workout when you use that? Yeah. Caffeine's interesting. Used properly. It's actually healthy. It's got some health properties used improperly and it's very bad for us. Uh, the doses, the dose and the time and when you use it is so individual. It's incredible. Some people, caffeine is just the stress on the body, like just any caffeine. Um, other people, caffeine, uh, is a cognitive booster. It's, it's, uh, it's got brain health benefits. All of us need to learn how to cycle on and off caffeine. So, um, it's a good idea to go off caffeine a little bit and then, or reduce your dose and then go back to your normal dose. But it's a very individual. If my stress level is real high, I drop my caffeine down because caffeine can add stress. You know, it's like, you know, I mean, look, we've all, I think, done that, right? Where we're anxious and then we'll have coffee. And like, why did I do that? I'm even more anxious now. So, um, but I do, I do time it. I work out first thing in the morning at about 6 a.m. So I do have caffeine at 5.30. Um, and that gives me that little bit of that energy or whatever uh, for my workout. It's interesting you mentioned working out first thing in the morning. Is that just out of convenience or is that when you find you're the strongest? Because I've heard other no. people talk about waiting till the afternoon if they want to get the most out of the workout and be able to push it to the max. Yeah, you know, um, the number one thing you should consider with your workouts are is consistency because that's the number that's the most that's the most challenging thing. Okay. It shouldn't be performance. Like, wh when am I the strongest? Unless you're an athlete at a high level and you're competing in something. It, it is true that when they do studies, people tend to be a little stronger in the afternoon um, and have better stamina. It's a small percentage difference, but it's true. But so what? Uh, I have, you know, three kids, four, 
coming on the way. I have a business. Uh, I'm married. I have other responsibilities. There's no way I could consistently work out if I didn't do it first thing in the morning. The other thing is I like to frame my day with my workout. So I start off with my workout and then I come here and I do my podcast and I do my media and I, it just feels great. It's a great way to start the day. So I've identified that for, for myself. And I, I would dare to say that's probably best for most people who have busy lifestyles to start the day that way so that it's always something that you do and things can't, you know, it's, it's harder for things to get in the way. But at the end of the day, the best time to work out is the day, is the time of day that you'll find easiest for you to be consistent. That's just the bottom line. That makes sense. And I like how you tied this to a piece you talked about earlier, where if you're doing it in the morning and then coming into work, you're obviously not pushing it to the point like you instructed earlier, where you're tired after the workout, you're getting energy from it, using that as a catalyst to get into the day. Yes. So people need to just want to touch back on that point from before where you should be able to use this as something to get yourself invigorated, energized and feeling your best if you're not pushing it too hard. A hundred percent. So I used to have clients that would do it right after work before they got home. So they would work and then they'd work out. And the reason why they they liked it uh, after the workout, excuse me, after work and before um, going home was because then they could present their best self when they saw their spouse and their kids. Because they, you know, these were clients of mine, right? So they were working out properly and all that stuff. And they'd be like, you know, I feel so good after my workout. I love doing it right after work, right before I get home, because then I'm in a good mood and whatever stress and stuff that happened from work tends to dissipate. So, so yeah, no, that's, that's a, that's a big point for me too, is, is I come in here and I, we do our media and our podcasting stuff. And, um, I feel I'm, I'm more likely to feel great because I just finished my workout. So Sal, we talked about the eating piece. We got into supplements Something really popular in today's health and wellness space is intermittent fasting. And I know you have a really interesting take on this and you're, you've evolved over the years to have something small in the morning, maybe a protein shake in the afternoon, and then have your dinner, your biggest meal, I think around 5 p.m. So talk about the evolution to that and, and why you do it that way. I don't even do that anymore. In fact, um, at, at the moment now, I have a... A, I do have a breakfast, I do have a lunch, and then dinner still is my largest meal. So you may be wondering, what, what do you mean? You said, you know, you eat this particular way in the book. Well, yeah, when I wrote that. So your 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 food intake, your what you eat, when you eat, how you eat, you need to, it, just like your workouts, it needs to improve the quality of your life, which means if your life changes, the context of your life changes, so does your diet, so does your workouts. Okay. So intermittent fasting has some benefits, but it can also have some detriments depending on who I'm talking to. Okay. So to give just an, a, this is a very easy, blatant example, but if I'm dealing, if I'm talking with someone that has a history of restrictive eating, right. Or is a history of disordered eating in the restrictive sense, the last thing I'm going to do is recommend intermittent fasting because that's just putting them back into this space that they were in before where it wasn't so good for them, right? If I'm talking to somebody like I was, where, you know, I came from the space for from the space where I wanted to always build muscle, um, you know, that, that's where my body images lied, that uh, I had to eat every two or three hours. Intermittent fasting was amazing because I, it helped me break those chains. You know, I'm not going to eat for 10 hours and I have to deal with my feelings. And also I'm realizing that, you know, it's okay to not eat for 10 hours, right? So, there's a lot of value in that depending on the person and who's using it. And then some people just find structured eating that that structured time frame helps them develop a more balanced, uh, better relationship with food. For example, someone may notice that, you know, man, um, the worst eating that I do is after 6 PM. Like when I, when I'm done with work, my stress is high. I want to sit on the couch, watch Netflix, and I always eat terrible food. So here's what I'm going to do from now for now is I'm going to give myself a time limit. I'm going to eat all my food before 5 p.m. After 5 p.m., no food. So it's a hard and fast rule that allows the person to work through that period of time when they tend to have or make bad food choices. They're just not giving themselves the food. So now they got to deal with those feelings, develop a different relationship with those feelings. And then maybe later they can reintroduce food at that particular time. But there is no right answer with this. The right answer is the way that works best for you, the way that improves the quality of your life best. And don't ignore the signals of your body, including the psychological signals, 
not just the physical signals. Those are the, that your body is constantly telling you what's working and what's not working. And the reason why I'm saying don't ignore it is because sometimes people will follow a diet, they read about it, or my friend did it, and then they'll ignore the signals that their body's telling. Like I remember when, when the ketogenic diet was such a big thing, I had somebody come to me and say, hey, Sal, I'm following the keto diet because I know it's really good and I read about it and you know, um, you know, it's, it's been three months now. I'm still constipated and my energy's still terrible. Like, when am I supposed to, when am I going to start feeling better? And I said, it's not the diet for you. It's been three months. It's, it's not good. You're not listening to your body. Let's try something else. And they did and they felt uh, much better. So the, the, those things are very flexible. It just, it, you want to, you want to mold it and shape it in a way that improves the quality of, of, of your life in the context of your life as it is. Sal, there's no denying right now we're in the middle of a health crisis when it comes to chronic disease, the amount of people that are overweight and obese. And to me, there's two different ways of looking at this. Are people getting the right information to apply? And then secondarily, or not even secondarily, the other arm of it is do they have the discipline to apply it? So how do you feel about that and the root of what we're going through right now? Uh, Well, it's been, uh, we've been on this path now for uh, a few decades. Um, and I, the, one of the reasons why I think it's so challenging is modern life is really geared and designed in a way to where the default is poor health. So we've made things um, easier in terms of physical activity or the sense that we don't have to move as much. We've Our markets have given us what we want when it comes to food. So uh, food is hyper palatable, very convenient. Um, and you combine those two things and you have uh, poor health. And then you add into that um, a medical system that doesn't do a good job of helping people deal with chronic issues, but rather comes up with Band-Aid type solutions. And there's a lot of potential reasons as to why, one of which being it's hard to get people to make changes to their life. It's easy to give people a pill and have them to take, you know, take it, especially if it gives them some uh, initial kind of relief. So when you combine all those things, uh, there's there's really um, no question as to why we would end up here or, or how we're here. Now, you mentioned discipline, and uh, I like using that word, but a lot of people think that the opposite of that means that they're lazy. That's not really the case. Um, discipline, uh, there's, there's lots and lots and lots of people who maybe suffer from uh, chronic health issues or even just obesity who are also extremely disciplined in other parts of their lives. Really, it's just a skill that a lot of us haven't practiced or developed around um, a lifestyle that promotes good health. And part of that reason is because you have to step outside of what's normal. It's not normal to, or should I say average, to structure activity into your day. You have to literally plan it, right? It's not common to eat only, let's say, whole natural foods or to avoid uh, hyper palatable processed foods that tend to promote overeating. So... Um, the path towards discipline, which leads to the better health, is really identifying those things and then starting to implement some of those practices slowly over time so that you then have the discipline around those types of things. But it's challenging. It really is challenging because if you just go about your your life the way you're supposed to, the default is going to be you're, you're going to be obese, you're probably going to develop diabetes, and you're not going to feel very good. And that's just that's just the way it is, and you have to step outside of that in order to change things. So it's definitely an uphill battle. You mentioned information. There's a lot of really good information uh, that's out there. Uh, There's also a lot of bad information. Uh, I like to put, when we talk about information, I like to blame uh, the space that I work in, the health and fitness space, uh, for some of the problems because we tend to put out a lot of information that counters previous information or counters each other. And we get into these kind of battles over who is more right. This guy over here says, paleo is the best diet. And then you got somebody else that says, no, plant-based is the way you're supposed to eat. And then this person over here says, count your calories. This person over here says calories don't matter. So people get confused. Um, So what I try to do a lot is talk to people in my space, trying to convince them to really, um, uh, you know, hone in the message, focus on the big rocks, not confuse people. Because if we don't tackle this uh, properly and effectively, this problem really threatens to bankrupt society uh, as we know it. So it's the biggest problem. That, By the way, chronic health issues also encompass the mental health issues that we're also suffering from, anxiety and depression, 
are closely, closely connected to poor physical health. It all, it's all connected. So um, this is a big problem for sure. Well, we can look at this from another angle too, because you're in a unique position as somebody who's been in this world for, I think it's two and a half decades and you've worked with people and you've seen people that are successful, people that aren't. When it comes to the people that have made this work and stuck with it for a long period of time, what do you feel the key difference is there? Well, I th people who do it the right way, okay, because you can find somebody that's super consistent with diet and exercise, but they've also developed a poor relationship with those things, and it becomes more body obsession, um, and you're just, you know, what's the term? Um, robbing Peter to pay Paul type of deal. Uh, so they'll eschew good uh, relationships with people, um, and it becomes a kind of a, like I said, abuse uh, relationship, in which case they may have better health in some ways, but poor health in other ways. So uh, taking those people aside, and the reason why I said that, by the way, is a lot of people in my space who display these amazing physiques that aren't necessarily healthy, that we think uh, are healthy. But if you do it the right way, right, you have this really balanced, healthy relationship with exercise and nutrition. It's something you do on a consistent basis. The root of that is really caring for yourself in the, the truest sense. So that's where it starts. It starts from this... Uh, standpoint of like, I want to care for myself. I, I, and, the, and the truth, I want to be healthy. I want to care for myself. Um, and the side effects being, you know, I look good and all that other stuff. But really the main thing is I just want to feel good and be healthy in the truest sense. And then it's going to be a, a slow step-by-step -step approach. And if you do it that way, then you develop a, a relationship with exercise and diet where you enjoy it. And that's really how you can become consistent forever, where it's something that you value to the point where there's an enjoyment. And I don't mean necessarily pleasure, although uh, you know, a good relationship with exercise and diet does have lots of moments of, you know, where it feels good from a pleasurable standpoint. Um, I mean enjoying it uh, the same way you may enjoy struggling and other things that you find lots of value in, right? So like I have children. Anybody who has kids knows it's not always, you know, fun and pleasure. It's 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 uh, oftentimes very challenging. But um, I enjoy it because of the value that it brings me. So, uh, you know, without getting too specific, I guess, uh, I, I would say that's kind of the, the main theme that uh, underlines, uh, you know, the consistency that some people will have when they've developed that relationship with those things. And for somebody who's been trying to tackle this for a number of years and maybe has some success and then bounces back and loses their momentum when it comes to fitness and diet, and they want to do that deeper work and get to the the source of really caring for themselves and doing this from the right place. If they don't have that self love and that that wanting to take care of themselves in the truest sense, how do they begin to form that? Yeah. So um, when you say self love, which is that that is exactly what it is. A lot of people picture the warm fuzzy feeling that you get. Um, you know, my friend Arthur Brooks says that the warm, fuzzy feeling is not love. That's evidence that love may be there. It's like smelling Thanksgiving dinner, but it's not the Thanksgiving dinner, right? So when 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 I'm talking about self-care or love, I mean the action of, of it. Because you're not always going to have warm, fuzzy feelings towards yourself. It just doesn't work that way. So, and I want to say that because someone listening might be like, you know, what are you talking about? Like sometimes I, I'm disappointed in myself or I don't feel... Like, I want to hug myself. Like, it's a strange thing, you know, that sounds way too out there. It doesn't make any sense. No, that's just the action. So you can say to yourself, you know, what would be steps I could take to care for myself in the truest sense? If you start there, uh, then the steps tend to be more appropriate. So uh, if you are not exercising now and you say, I need to care for myself, then you know that the answer to that is not to go from zero days a week to six days a week in the gym. You're going to go and you're going to slowly do it and you're going to get your body to um, get used to the exercise. You're going to train with an appropriate level of intensity, not to the point where you can't move anymore. You're going to feel like you're throwing up. That's not how you care for someone. Um, and if you do it that way, you'll take the necessary small steps and you're not going to have this like horrible experience where a lot of people, you know, they, they, they'll start off and, and they're not coming from really a self-care standpoint, it's more of a, like, I hate myself or I'm inadequate or, you know, I'm, I'm not sexy or I'm gross or whatever. And then they overdo it and they go to the gym and they beat the crap out of themselves or they take too many steps 
in a, you know, whatever direction and it just becomes unsustainable. So it's got to be a slow process and it's got to be from a real self-care standpoint. And then balance is baked into that because there are going to be times when caring for yourself means you're working out. And there's going to be lots of times or other times when caring for yourself means you're not going to the gym today because maybe you didn't sleep well or you're not feeling so well or, um, you know, your, your stress levels are too high and intense exercise might not be good for you. For somebody that wants to dive into this and right now we'll use fitness as the example, they want to start slow and, and get that right stimulus. How do they begin to figure that out? Because the natural inclination for somebody that isn't doing anything at this point and wants to get started and make big changes is going to be to push it to the point of hurting themselves or to the point where they're actually hating the actual routine that they're going through. Yeah. So how do they find that sweet spot when it comes to stimulus? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll use another analogy. Remember the the body changes from exercise, right? So the goal here is let's say become more fit or um, improve my strength or my stamina or let's say get leaner, build muscle, right? So that's kind of the the aim is to get those types of results. Well, exercise doesn't do that. Exercise causes that. What I mean by that is exercise is a stress on the body and then the body adapts to that stress so that that stress no longer becomes a stress. Now, this is why you end up adding weight to the bar or going a little harder because then you have to kind of add a little more stress to get the body to change again. But, but, but it is a stress. Your body adapts from the stress. If the stress is too high, you will overcome your body's ability to adapt. And then your body's just focused on healing. So here's the analogy I like to use with another system of adaptation of the body, which is your skin's ability to tan when exposed to the sun. So when you go out into the sun, the UV rays from the sun are a stress on the skin. Then your body, you know, it uses things like melanin to darken the skin, to adapt to that stress so that that stress no longer stresses you. And then if you want to get any darker, you have to stay on the sun a little bit longer or with a little bit more intensity to continue to, to let's say, let's say further the tan along. Well, imagine if you haven't been out in the sun for a while and you went outside and you spend too long in the sun. Are you going to get a tan? No, you're going to get sunburn. You're going to get sunburn. You're not going to get a tan. Your body's only going to want to heal from that sunburn and you know, you haven't accomplished anything really. And if anything, you've reduced your ability to um, get further sun exposure. There's a lot of danger, of course, associated with that. So what would be the best way to get a tan if you haven't been out in the sun very long, very much? You go out and get a little bit of exposure, just a little more than you're used to. So anything more than you're used to now will get your body to adapt. That's all. So if you do nothing, literally five squats is going to be more than you're doing now, or a 10-minute walk is more than you're doing now. There's a couple other things you want to look at, right? Uh, muscle soreness is a good indicator that you might have done too much. Um, you 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 either shouldn't feel sore or feel a little bit of soreness after a workout, like the kind of soreness you have to search for. So you kind of stretch and move and go, oh, I think I worked out. Like that's okay, that's good. You don't want the kind of soreness where you're moving funny or you can you just touch it and the muscle is is hurting. You, you went way too hard. You've gone beyond what's necessary for the adaptation to occur, which means you've also now compromised your body's ability to adapt. Now your body's mainly just focusing on, on healing. Um, so those are kind of some things that I would pay attention to in terms of what's the right intensity. And I, I do want to be very clear, when you're looking at the, uh, the stimulus that exercise uh, provides that causes the adaptation, there's a perfect dose and that perfect dose will get you the fastest results, okay? More than that will get you results slower. Less than that, of course, gets you results slower as well. So it's the perfect dose. So it's like this bell curve. So when you hit that perfect amount, you feel energized after. So you feel good. You feel good throughout the day. The next day, you're not really sore or maybe you're maybe a tiny bit sore. And you just kind of feel like, wow, that was, that was not bad. That's the right dose. More than that is going to get you there slower. And I have to say that because I need to sell the idea because people tend to think, well, if I do a little more than what he said, then I'll get there faster. You won't. You'll actually get there slower. So it's the right dose. You should feel good and it should feel like a smooth process. Now, someone may be confused right now because 
they go on social media and they see people having these crazy, these really fit people just beating the crap out of themselves, having these crazy workouts. Well, you know, consider their fitness level, their level of experience, and how long they've been working out. In order to get their bodies to further adapt or to accomplish any more uh, performance gains or strength gains, they need they do need to train at a very high intensity because they've already been training for so long to get any further. It's going to be really hard, you know. Taking a couch potato, to taking someone who's who doesn't run at all and getting them to run a mile without stopping, okay, is easier than taking an Olympic gold medalist and having them shave off 0.2 seconds off of their mile time. I mean, that sounds like nothing, but when you're talking about super high performance, squeezing out anything else is like you are moving the smallest pieces to make that happen. So don't look at these hyper fit, super consistent athletes and, you know, models or whatever on, on social media and say, oh, I need to work out like that. That's not what you need. To do. For your body, the right dose looks a lot different. And for the person who tuning in right now is looking to get incorporate resistance training to the point of getting the health benefits yeah. and they have a busy life, you know, this is just going to be one piece of their health and wellness foundation. How do they know what that goal is they're trying to get to? Obviously they're going to want to ramp up if this is new to them and take their time getting into it. But once they're in a cadence and this is part of their routine, how much do we need to do to get, say, 80% of the benefits when it comes to health and wellness? Most people could get probably all the results that they want with about two days a week of strength training. More advanced, you're looking at three, maybe four, and that's it. Um, so I trained people for years, and the average person, you know, is not trying to look like a bodybuilder or walk on stage and, you know, have veins in their shoulders. The average person wants to look good and feel good. They want to have an improvement in the quality of your life. You could go really far with a well-structured two-day-a-week strength training routine. For somebody who's not exercising right now at all or doing any strength training at all, they'll get phenomenal results probably for a good six-month period with just one day a week. So it doesn't require a lot. Strength training sends the signal. The rest of the week is what is the, is the – that's where the adaptation um, is happening. Now, the workout within that time frame changes – so a two day a week routine for a beginner looks very different than when they become, you know, more advanced. They've been training for a year or two uh, consistently. But there's so much you could do with just that that most people don't need more than that. Now people are probably wondering, well, you know, so I'm only going to be active one or two days a week? No, no, no. We're talking about strength training. In terms of activity, it's a good idea to be active every day. Now, what does that look like for most people? Walking. For most people, if you were to take two to three, 10 to 15 minute walks a day for the rest of your life, you're going to get, you know, 85% of the benefits that activity will provide you in terms of health and longevity. Now you're not going to have super stamina and endurance, but in terms of the health benefits, tremendous just from doing that. And I like to structure those post meal. So it's like breakfast, 10 minute walk, lunch, 10 minute walk, dinner, 10 minute walk, 30 minute walk every single day. Or if you go 15, turns into 45 minutes. And you're, you're doing phenomenal. And I'm talking about the average person. Again, this is a person with a family, a job. They're not trying to make their life revolve around fitness. They just want to have great longevity, health, mobility, energy benefits from it. That's it. You don't need to do a whole lot. It's just, it's got to be done right. Having the muscle on the body is going to increase the metabolism. Let's, let's talk about other benefits while we're hashing this all out. Yes. So one of my favorites, um, and I kind of mentioned this a little bit, is it doesn't take a lot of uh, time and effort to reap the main benefits of strength training versus other forms of exercise. So if the main benefit of the form of exercise that you're doing is the calorie burn, well, that means I have to do the activity to, to reap those benefits. Okay. And by the way, I do want to say being active generally is good for you. So before I come across as being anti- movement, anti-cardio, anti-whatever. Just moving is good for you. I think it's very important that people try to move every single day, but I do have better strategies uh, for people in terms of consistency when it comes to um, exercise on a, on, a, on a daily basis, and we'll, we can get to that. But strength training itself, 
the main adaptation is the muscle building signal. And once you've sent it, you're done. Okay. Two days a week, three days a week, you can go very, very far with that much dedication to exercise. In fact, the average person with a good 35 minute strength training routine twice a week will get quite a bit uh, of those results. They'll build great strength. You'll see good, some good muscle gain. The average man will probably gain eight pounds of lean body mass within the first year, female probably around four pounds of lean body mass. And you'll see these, all those positive effects that I talked about. Now, why is that important? Look, um, I made a career on helping people develop a relationship with exercise and nutrition that was forever. Okay. That was lifelong. I remember five years into my personal training career after having lots of monetary success and grand, you know, grand opening gyms, doing the whole thing. I had this like realization where, um, I had to be honest with myself and it was like, I, I really wasn't doing people very, a lot of good. I, yeah, people could lose weight when they worked with me, but then they all stopped afterwards. Like, you know, what's going on? And I used to think, oh, it was because people are lazy or they lack discipline or they whatever. But the reality is it's like, we got to figure this out. And if, if I really want to help people, I got to come up with a solution because this just isn't working. Um, and it took me a long time to really kind of piece it together what this looks like. And part of it was the realization that the most we could hope for, for the average person in terms of consistent, structured, scheduled exercise, okay? The most we could ever hope for is about two or three days a week. That's it. We're not going to get more than that. Just we need to give up trying to get people to become fitness fanatics. It's not going to happen. Fitness fanatics tend to work in the fitness space. Most people, if they do a good job, if they you know stay consistent, if they practice uh, proper exercise, if they practice building that relationship with exercise and nutrition, most people will average forever, which is great, about two or three days a week of exercise. So I had to work within that. Okay, what can I do two or three days a week that'll make the biggest impact? Well, strength training is just so effective in its adaptation process that you don't need you don't need to do it every single day. In fact, uh, every single day is overkill uh, for most people. The only people who need to do strength training five or six days a week are super extreme, advanced, you know, strength athletes and bodybuilders and and that kind of stuff. Average person, you're going to get a great sculpted, fit, healthy physique about two or three days a week. Another piece to this that um, is profoundly important are the, and this is for lack of a better term, are the permanence of the results that you get from strength training. Now, I say lack of a better term because nothing's permanent. The body's constantly adapting to your activity and your lifestyle, okay? Your body's always trying to become better at uh, dealing with your current lifestyle. So that's how it adapts, okay? So nothing's permanent. But the results that you get from strength training are more permanent than other forms of exercise. Okay, so there's a well-known phenomenon in, in science uh, in, in when it comes to exercise research known as muscle memory. Okay, muscle memory looks like this. When you build muscle, it's a slow, long process. But once you've built that muscle, if you lose that muscle, gaining it back is, you gain it back in a fraction of the time. Okay, now... A lot of people have already experienced this. If you've ever injured uh, a joint or broken a bone and had to wear a cast, and then you take the cast off and you're like, oh my gosh, my muscle is gone. My leg is skinny. My arm is, where did my muscle go? And then within a couple months, the muscle is back and the arm looks the way it did before. That's muscle memory at work. This is a, an evolutionary thing we all have. And they've identified the, and we don't have to get into the weeds with how this works. It has to do with things like called satellite, satellite cells and all that. But nonetheless, it's a very well-observed process. It's well accepted. So if it took you, for example, a year of consistent two or three days a week to boost your metabolism, gain, let's say, 10 pounds of lean body mass, um, and, and you know all the wonderful benefits of that. And then let's say for whatever reason, you stop exercising for three months, four months, you become totally sedentary. And you lose all 10 pounds of muscle. And then you decide, yeah, I'm going to start working out again. You'll gain that 10 pounds back in two months. Okay. So it took you 12 months to gain it the first time. You'll gain it back in two months the second time around. This is called muscle memory. Not to mention the muscle loss process is a slow process. Okay. So if you 
In fact, our bodies evolved to maintain strength more than it did to maintain things like stamina, endurance, and even flexibility. Strength is something that sticks around for quite a bit. So if you work out consistently, 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 and then go on a two-week vacation and don't work out, and then go hit the gym, you'll find that very little, if any, strength has been gone. Now, you might get sore after your workout. You might feel it. You might not have the same stamina, but that strength stuck around. In fact, oftentimes people come back stronger because they needed the break. You won't find this with other forms of adaptation. So muscle loss takes a long time. Now, why is this important to communicate? Because the average person is also going to go through periods of inactivity. Life gets in the way, you know, um, you know, in, in, in 10 weeks or so, I'm going to have another baby. So my wife is pregnant. I probably am not going to work out as much as I normally do during that first few months. Right. Um, you know, job, we change our jobs, we get ill, um, whatever, you know, whatever things get in the way we stop exercising. Wouldn't it be great to keep some of those effects during that period of time and not lose them immediately and feel like you lost everything? Well, strength training does that better um, than other forms of exercise. So for those reasons and more, it really is the modern prescription of exercise. It really is the form of exercise that, that best solves modern health issues, which are uh, obesity, insulin resistance. Um, we are busy, but we're also inactive. You know, uh, you know, people like to say, you know, they think, oh, we're not, we're, we're, first off, studies will show this. We're actually busier now than we were 20 years ago. I mean, I have kids, right? I have three kids. And I, like I said, I have one on the way. I, when I was a kid, nobody scheduled play dates and appointments for me to do stuff. I just went outside, right? Nowadays, the average, pre the average parent schedules these things. The average kid is involved in two or three extra activities, the average person has a smartphone with email and text and work tends to follow them home. We tend to be busier than ever, but we're also more sedentary than ever. So we need a form of exercise that fits into that kind of schedule or that makes it so that we don't have to radically change everything just to, to schedule some exercise. And again, strength training suits that best. And then, you know, for all the other reasons that I mentioned. That muscle memory piece is fascinating. It's something I've heard over the years, but I didn't know if it was a myth or not. So important to look at it more like the work you're doing with resistance training is for a lifetime, you may have ebbs and flows, but when you put that work in, if you get back to it later, it's going to help reignite. Yes. And, and the body prepares for this. Okay. So when you first build muscle, it adds, you know, muscle fibers grow you get more capillaries, you get more of the non-muscle fiber structures within muscle, but you also get what are called satellite cells and those don't go away. So you lose the muscle, but your muscle is primed to go back to where it was before. And this is an, an evolutionary thing, probably to help us heal from injury, but it sticks with us. So if you, like, again, you gain muscle, you lose it, you gain it back so much faster. And you talk to any athlete, you talk to any strength athlete and they'll tell you, Oh yeah, this is uh in fact, I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret, a little supplement industry secret or weight loss diet pill industry secret. A lot of those before and afters that you see when they're trying to sell you a, a weight loss diet pill where you see the guy before and after and you're like, oh my gosh, in 60 days he lost body fat and he looks so shredded. You know what they do is they take strength athletes or people who are fitness fanatics and they approach them and they say, we want you to get out of shape. Uh, and, and we'll take that, that'll be the before picture and that'll be the after picture or a little bit more integrity, but still not very much uh, integrity is they'll take somebody who is a fitness fanatic who fell off. They'll approach them and say, Hey, can you get back in shape? And we'll make that the after picture. And then they got that muscle memory and they boom, 60 days, you see this radical transformation, little supplement industry secret right there. Never heard of that or thought of it that way, but <laughs> yeah. wow. Sneaky. Well, what about, let's come back to cardio, the cardio piece. So somebody who's say trained for triathlons, marathons, super long distance stuff for a number of years, and they form that body over say 10 to 20 years, because that's what they were, you know, training their body to do. Are they always going to have a predisposition to go back to that body form if they get away from that activity or does it not work that way? No, it doesn't work that way. So they still have the muscle memory when it comes to strength. So all activity 
requires a certain level of strength. So some require more, some require less. That long distance kind of steady state type of cardio, it still requires some strength to stabilize your joints, to prevent you from obviously flopping down the floor. So they'll have some of that muscle memory, but it's not the same as if they had built you know, 10, you know, 10 pounds of lean body mass, all that stuff. Um, no, they're not predisposed in that particular way. And again, I do want to be clear, like all forms of exercise and activity have value. And if that's what you love doing, if you love running every day, like that's your passion, uh, I'm not telling you to stop doing that. Okay. I, I think, I think, uh, activity is, is great. I think having a passion for being active is amazing. It inc it really has a dramatic effect on quality of life and of course health. So I'm not trying to dissuade people who really, you know, who really enjoy doing that, who've been doing it for years and years and years. The person that I'm talking to is the average person who has who struggles, who has lost weight and gained it back, who can't figure it out, who can't figure out how to stay consistent, who finds that each time they gain the weight back, it's harder to lose it than it was the time before. Who's sitting there saying, you know what? I don't eat a whole lot, but my gosh, this body weight just sticks to my body. Like what the heck is going on? Like, and, and, and the person who says, look, I, I can't, I can't exercise every day. It just doesn't work. I, I just, my schedule's crazy. I don't want to sacrifice other things in my life and I can't like, you know, I'm lost. What do I do? Those are the people I'm talking to. Um, but you know, if you're a fitness fanatic and you're doing what you love, like, yeah, yeah, keep, keep doing that. Well, let's talk directly to that person. Say somebody is tuning in right now. They're long distance running, not because they love it, but because, you know, this is what they heard is good for weight loss and it's yeah. works somewhat. Like you mentioned before, it works in the beginning, but now they're at the position where they've lost muscle mass, their metabolism is wrecked and they've had to, like you talked about before, cut back calories, cut back calories. And now they're feeling stuck. It's like, I got to run every day. I got to eat very yeah. little calories. How do they slowly, I'm assuming resistance training is a piece of this, but how would you recommend to that person that's been doing this for a long time, how, or even can they rebuild that metabolism? Oh, totally. Yeah. It, it, so it is a reversing out process. So what you would do is you would, you would cut your, your cardiovascular activity down. So cut your running down or your cycling or whatever you're doing, and then replace it with some strength training and don't change your diet just yet. So here's what happens initially, because you're, let's say you're running five days a week and then you hear this and you're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make this happen. So I'm only going to run three days a week and then I'm going to start strength training two days a week. Okay. So I'm still working out five days a week, for example, those two days a week of strength training are going to burn less calories than the two days a week of running that you were doing before. So you may think, well, maybe I should cut my calories because now I'm burning less calories. No, don't do that. Because you're doing the strength training, your body's gonna take those calories and move it towards muscle building. So we need those calories now to have the muscle building process. And then what I want you to do is pay attention to your strength. Am I getting stronger? Yes, I am. I can do more squats, I can do more push-ups, or I can do more overhead press or whatever your strength training routine looks like. And then cut the cardiovascular activity down even more. You don't need to do more than two or three days a week of strength training. So it doesn't need to be a one-to-one. -one. So if you're doing five days a week of running, you're not going to replace it with five days a week of strength training. You're going to stay around two or three days a week. Okay. Because there's a lot you can do within those two or three days a week from intensity to how much weight you're lifting to the types of exercises. Like there's so many moving parts within that workout that will that we can take it to make it more and more appropriate as your fitness level increases. The very last thing you ever would need to add would be more days. So don't worry about that. So it would look like I'm running five days a week. Now I'm only running three days a week. So I'll add two days a week of strength training. As I start to see my strength improve, then I cut down the, the, the running down to two days a week. As I see more improvements in strength, I'll cut, cut it down to one day a week. And then if eventually I can cut it all out and then just move purely to strength training, or you can keep some of the running and some of the strength training if you enjoy you know, that kind of combination. But what I'm interested in is beyond that, when it comes to males and females, when it comes to exercise, how do they have to look at things differently or do they? No, no, there's no difference. It's, uh, it, the differences are on an individual level, but there's no like men do this and women do that. Um, our bodies adapt the same. Of course, the capacity for strength and muscle is much higher in men. 
There's a lot of reasons for that. One of them being the hormones, but there's lots of other reasons for that. Like you could take the testosterone out of a man and he's going to probably build more strength and muscle than a woman would anyway. Um, so, uh, but aside from that, there's no difference. I mean, marketing, you know, so you're going to see routines for women and men, but that's because they know that it's effective marketing, but there's no, there's no difference at all. It's all on the individual. So whatever works better for you and how you move and the mobility issues you may have and your lifestyle, that's what you should pay attention to. Don't pay attention to, I'll say this, look, I'll, t I'll say this, avoid, if you're a woman watching and listening to this right now, avoid workout routines that are designed for women because all they did was take an effective routine and water it the hell down and probably colored it with some, you know, feminine color and marketing to make it appeal to women. But what they typically do is they'll take an effective workout, make it easier, make it lighter, make you do a million more reps. And then they say, here it is for women. So that's kind of a rule of thumb. Like women, like workouts designed for women are usually worse than just normal workouts. All right. So you just smashed one of the big myths there when it comes to resistance training between males and females. What are some of the other ones? You've been in this world for longer than longer than most people. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of the different myths and probably even believed and applied some of them over the years. What are some of the things people are doing that are just total BS that they need to ignore? Yeah, um, you can't. Your muscle shape is determined by largely by your genetics. Um, so you, there aren't exercises that give you long, lean muscles versus others that develop big, bulky muscles or anything like that. Um, muscles build or shrink. Your genetics determine largely their shape, aside from the large muscle groups where targeted exercises develop different parts. For example, the chest, that could develop the upper chest more than the lower chest, vice versa. Uh, but for the most part, it's your genetics and muscles build or shrink. They don't tone, you know, they don't sculpt, they tone, they build, sorry, or they shrink. Another myth is that, um, you know, strength training is going to produce a bulky look in women. No, that doesn't, that's not, that's not what's going to happen. Building muscles, very dense. If every woman watching this right now gained 10 pounds of muscle and simultaneously lost 10 pounds of fat. So their weight was the same on the scale. They would be smaller. They would look smaller, much smaller, but they would lose about a quarter of the size on their body because fat takes up more space. So the whole fear of like, oh no, I'm going to work out with weights and then I'm going to look like Arnold. Uh, that's not, that's not the case at all. What about the thought that if you do certain workouts, you can burn fat in different areas, no. say, you know, like the double chin or the tummy targeting different areas of fat burning? You can target development, like I'm going to develop my shoulders, I'm going to develop my bicep, I'm going to develop my hamstrings, but you can't target fat. Fat loss is uh, determined by genetics and hormones. Hormonal changes can change fat storage patterns a bit, uh, like higher cortisol, more insulin resistance can cause more fat storage in the midsection. But, it, it, but that and genetics are what determine where you store. So good rule of thumb is the first place you put it on you know, people are like, oh my God, I, I eat bad. And it's like, my, right away, I feel my belly or my hips or whatever. The first place you put it on is the last place you'll lose it. And there's, you can, you can either thank or curse your parents for that. There's not much you could do other than just get leaner overall. For somebody who isn't feeling that self-love at a deep level, so they really can't get that inertia going, how do they begin to do that work? Okay. Well, well, first off, love is not a feeling. Okay. So, um, Look, if, if you talk to anybody who's been married for, you know, more than a year, right? <laughs> You've been married for four. Talk to people who've been married for 40 or 50 years, right? My parents just celebrated their 45th anniversary. Ask them, have you, ever, have you always liked this person? Have you always had that warm, fuzzy love feeling for them? And they'll, they'll be honest and they'll say, no, there's periods of time we don't like each other or whatever, but I chose to love that person, okay? Love is an action. It's not a feeling. Now, it often comes with that feeling, but the feeling itself is not love. Love is a choice. So when you look in the mirror and you say, I'm going to take care of myself, don't wait for the feeling of love to happen. You have to act on it. I need to love myself through action because I deserve to be taken care of like someone I care about. You know, like if you have kids, look, raising kids is like this. 
have teenagers. You can't, you're not going to tell me you, you've got that warm, fuzzy feeling for your teenagers all the time. There's going to be periods of time when you're going to look at your teenagers and be like, man, I don't like this kid. This kid is not somebody I like right now, but I choose to love them. I choose to still be his dad or, or, or her mom or whatever. Right? So it's the same thing for yourself. It is not a feeling. It is an action. So you have to look in the mirror and say to yourself, I choose to love myself. I choose to take those actions. And then we can talk about how we make the, how we develop the discipline to do so, how we develop those behaviors and skills, which is a whole nother, uh, a whole nother piece of this conversation. I got it. So it's a choice. We're not waiting for the feeling to come. We make the choice. We take action. Let's get into discipline. Yes. So, so now we're at that point. We're like, okay, uh, I'm going to choose to take care of myself. Um, cause I deserve it. All right. Wh- where do I start? Wh- what you don't want to do, especially if you start starting to feel motivated. So motivation is this feeling that we all just absolutely love because you don't need to, you don't need to tell me to work hard. You don't need to tell me to be a great dad or a great husband. You don't need to tell me to eat right and exercise when I'm motivated. Like when I'm motivated, I'm Superman. Okay. It's a wonderful feeling. And we're always chasing that feeling. The challenge is when the feeling goes away, which it does. Because nobody's permanently motivated. That's impossible. So what do we, how do we develop the behaviors that lead to consistency through periods of not being motivated or feeling kind of down or sad or anxious or whatever, right? How do we develop that? Well, we got to start point one or step one is asking yourself, what is one step I can take that is challenging? Because it has to be challenging. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. So what's one thing I can do that's challenging yet realistic for me forever? The context is forever. We're not looking to lose weight and gain it back in three months. Okay. What we want is we want to get there and we want to do this for the rest of our lives. Okay. So what's one step I can take that is challenging yet realistic forever. And then guess what? I don't care what that step is. I really don't care. It could be anything. I've had clients where step one was drink an extra glass of water every day. I had one lady I trained where this was such a challenge for her. And, and, I, and I mean, after five years of working with her, she uh, she developed an incredible relationship with exercise and nutrition. This is, by the way, this was 12 years ago. She's still doing this, right? She's still consistent. But when I first got her, she didn't drink water. It was Diet Coke. That's it. Her diet was uh, pizza rolls, bagels, uh, donuts. Um, she was very inflamed, poor health, um, you know, all the stuff. So it was just really bad starting point. And we, 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 a- we had this conversation. What is the first step we can take that is challenging yet realistic? And so we had to go from like, okay, can you walk uh, 15 minutes after breakfast? She's like, oh, I think I can. That's challenging. Okay, do you think that's realistic forever? She's like, well, if I'm being honest, no. So we had to, little by little, we whittled it down. And you know where we, you know where we went, where we started? She read one page of a book on nutrition once a week. That was her starting point. Now, over time, here's what happens. You start with that first step. And then you do it. And you wait for it to become a, a habit and a, and a behavior. So maybe for, for somebody watching, they say, okay, I can walk for five minutes after breakfast and lunch. I can go for a five minute walk after breakfast and lunch. And then they do that. And at first it's challenging. Oh, I got to go walk. I got to go walk. All right. I did this thing and, oh, you know, but I think I can do this forever. And then it becomes a behavior. Wow. I'm doing this. This is what I, 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 this is it. This is consistent. I like doing this. I enjoy doing this. This is great. Then you ask yourself again, what's the next step I could take that is challenging yet realistic forever. Now here's what happens through this process. And I've observed it many, many, many times. Each step gets bigger and bigger. And the time between each step gets shorter and shorter as we develop confidence and as we develop the skill of discipline. So it might start off with five minutes after breakfast and lunch. Then the next step is 15 minutes after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Then the next step is I'm going to go to the gym once a week. Then the next step is I'm going to cut sugar out. And you start to get this scaling effect. Now it's not super consistent linear. You do, you will have little setbacks, but it does kind of look like this over time, the step ladder. And you develop this and you develop these lifelong 
behaviors. And it takes a little bit of time and you have to be okay with that. You have to have, you have to be empathetic. This is a personal journey. The journey to develop, because remember, here's what we're dealing with. We are dealing with fundamental behaviors that we have. We're dealing with our, how we live, how we see things, how our life is structured. You don't change that overnight. You just don't. It doesn't work that way. I mean, anybody who goes to therapy for any ch challenging issue they have will tell you this. Like it's, 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 a, it's a process, okay? The way that we value and view food can change dramatically, but it takes time. Most people start off, and this is just a result of, uh, I mean, it's just a byproduct of how uh, effective we've, we've, as a society, been at uh, making hyper palatable, easily accessible, inexpensive food. Um, we've solved hunger in modern societies, but we've got a lot of side effects now as a result of that. And one of them is we mainly value food for its palatability, how hedonistic the food is. Like you talk to your friends and you say, Hey, what do you want to have for lunch? And it becomes like a, Ooh, Chinese food. Oh no, I think I'm craving Mexican food. Or, Ooh, you know, it sounds really good. So we tend to value food mainly for how, how hedonistic it is. And then everything that's attached to it. Can I, when I'm anxious, I reach for this. Or when I'm sad, I reach for this. Or when I want to have fun, I reach for this or whatever, right? So slowly what happens to this process is we learn to value food for all of its values. Because food has a lot of values, not just that. That's one value and it's a value. But there's also, how does this food affect my digestion? How does this affect this food affect my energy levels? How does this food affect my performance, my skin, my hair, my immune system? Um, how does this, uh, how can I connect with other people through this food? Cause there are foods that we love to eat when we're connecting with people. Uh, and this can be very different. Like I, my family is, uh, I'm, I'm a first generation American. My family comes from Sicily. So I have this cultural, you know, attachment to certain foods. And when I eat these foods, it's, it's when I'm with my family and when I'm with my parents or my aunts and my uncles, right? So there's all these different values to food. And when we're, when we go through this process that I'm talking about, we learn to, to value food for these types of things. And then what you'll find is you naturally start to develop this intuitive eating where you know when to reach for the pizza and you know when to reach for the chicken or the vegetables or the rice, you know, like uh, I'll, I'll tell you a personal story. So I did not like vegetables as a kid and as a young adult, just didn't like them. And because I entered into exercise through, uh, you know, I had my own body image issues, wanted to build muscle. I felt like I was really skinny. I really, you know, I valued food for how much muscle can this put on my body, right? So it was about proteins. It was about fats. It was about carbs. It was about calories. And vegetables really weren't on that, on that list. Not going to help me build muscle. I don't care. I don't like the way they taste anyway. I'm going to leave those alone. Well, anyway, in my early 30s, I had a bit of a, a health crisis where my digestive, my digestion um, really was, uh, affected negatively. At one point I thought I had Crohn's disease and, uh, you know, long story, but I had to really look at food differently. And through that process, I identified that well-cooked vegetables really, really had a positive effect on my digestive system and on my health. Now through that process, uh, I now, this is true. If I travel a lot, the first thing I crave when I come home is a bowl of well-cooked vegetables. Like I crave it. Now, I'm not going to lie to you and say uh, that from a palatability standpoint, they compare to like, you know, potato chips. They don't. But that doesn't mean I still don't crave them. I still value them because I've learned to identify that and become aware of that. And now I want them. I literally want them when I feel a particular way. You can do this over time and develop balance and develop balance. Because if you, if you look at how we tend to eat foods, we do have a very imbalanced relationship with them, you know, like, um, you, you know, here's an example. Uh, how many times have, uh, have you eaten something past the point of satiety, right? Where you finish eating that, that bowl of ice cream or those cookies or those chips, you're like, my gosh, my stomach hurts. I don't feel good. And you're like, you know, I wasn't feeling good 10 minutes ago, but I was still eating it. Right. Um, you know, that's, that's a relationship that we can work on to where when you become more aware, you eat the chip, you enjoy it, and then you stop. And it's not because you're 
telling yourself, I have to stop, you literally are like, I don't want any more. I don't want any more chips. I know they taste good. I know there's a hedonistic value to it, but I kind of don't want them anymore. What a great place to end up, right? So that's the, the process that I'm talking about. And it does take a little bit of time, but it's the only way to achieve this lifelong success with nutrition and, and with fitness. And I know for you, chips is a weakness. One of your things that you like to go to when you want to treat. Talk about your system you have in place where you don't say, no, I can never have chips anymore, but you don't keep them in the house. Yeah, yeah. Well, you got to know yourself, right? So um, identify the the triggers and challenges that you have um, and then um, create barriers between you and those things so that you can open the space up for awareness. Okay, so to get more specific, um, when it, for me at least, potato chips are hyper palatable and I can very easily, easily slip into impulsive um, snacking with them where I'm not aware, or at least when awareness kicks in, it's too late. Like, like, Oh, what have I, done? what have I done? Ate the whole bag or whatever. Right. So I've identified that with myself and we all have that. We all have that. And when you first start on this journey, like a lot of foods are in this list. So what you want to do is you want to identify the challenges that you have, the impulsive behaviors that you have that, that are not so healthy and then find a way to create a barrier so that you have some space to allow that awareness to kick in. So like, for example, um, marriage counselors will tell couples when you start to feel your heart get elevated and you start to feel, you know, they'll say flooded with all these emotions, pause, take a break and then come back and then resume the, the conversation or the argument. And the reason why they're doing that is they're you're, you're, you're taking yourself out of that impulsive behavior and allowing space for awareness to come in. And you can say, okay, well, I'm not going to say that to my wife and I, I, I can hear her a little better and, you know, we're not going to let this spiral out of control type of deal. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm talking about when it comes to um, this particular scenario with food. So if you've identified that for you, it's potato chips like it is for me. Uh, I don't say I can't have them uh, because obviously I can have them. I'm an adult. Um, I say, um, I'm not going to have them in the house. So if I really want them, I'll drive to the grocery store and get myself a serving of potato chips. Now, what does that mean? Well, when I really want them, I lace up my shoes, I go out to the car, I drive to the store and I buy the chips. But in that process of putting my shoes on, getting in the car, I have space for awareness. And so nine out of 10 times when I have that craving or whatever, that impulse, I, the awareness kicks in and I say, eh, I really don't want them. Actually, I think I'm just bored or I think I'm just anxious or, you know what? Let me eat left. Let me eat what I, what some leftovers from dinner first. Let me see if I still want those chips. So nine out of 10 times I don't have them. So you can do this with yourself by creating barriers between you and impulsive behaviors for someone else. It may be, um, it may be when they're stressed. So they may be like, man, when I am stressed, boy, am I, I, I reach for comforting foods. So you may say to yourself, okay, when I feel really stressed and I want to reach for food, the barrier is going to be a 30 minute, uh, timer. So you get home from work and you're like, oh my God, you know what? I just want to, I want to go eat a burger right now. Or I'm just, I'm, and then you set the timer 30 minutes. Say, okay, after 30 minutes, I'm going to go get it. And then just let this, just, just sit there and allow awareness to creep in. And what you'll find is through time, you'll be able to, um, manage these impulses or become more aware and create better behaviors around them. What do you recommend for somebody, say they're middle age, they've never had their testosterone tested. Is that the first step in determining what they need to do here? Yeah, I would get your, I would get testosterone and free testosterone tested because they're both important. Free testosterone is the testosterone that is actually active, okay? So sometimes there's cases where you could have good testosterone total, but then your free testosterone is low, so you have, because uh, it's bound up by uh, something called sex-binding hormone uh, globulin, uh, which means it's inactive, okay? So you could have low testosterone symptoms even though your total testosterone looks fine. But I would get testosterone levels checked, and then, uh, you know, get good consistent sleep, Eat a diet that's not lacking any nutrients. Uh, nutrient deficiencies can cause testosterone issues. So like zinc, magnesium, vitamin D being the most common. 
Um, I would have adequate fat and protein, especially protein, uh, in my diet. Do some strength training. And then you would probably notice a nice substantial increase in both total and free testosterone just from doing those things uh, consistently. Now, if you're doing all the right things and your testosterone levels are below where they should be, and I would say, you know, below 500 total is probably where some men will start to notice some side effects, definitely below 300. Um, then you can look at hormone therapy. Hormone therapy is becoming uh, much more common these days because we're not quite sure, but we think it has to do obviously in activity, less muscle, but we do think that there are hormone disrupting chemicals now in the environment that just weren't present a few decades ago that seem to be causing some havoc in our, our in men's hormones in particular. But before you look there, most men can significantly improve their testosterone levels by like 30, 40, 50% just from getting good sleep, improving their diet and doing strength training. And Sal, you mentioned the TRT there and how people may need to turn to that. I know part of your story is you got to a point where your health was failing and you touched on this, the fact that, you know, you want to start with lifestyle first and doing the right things, Yeah, which you were doing, but you weren't getting the results and your testosterone was bottoming out. Yeah. So take us back there, what you were feeling, where your levels were, and then eventually turning to TRT to bring that up. Yeah. So, uh, so people understand the context in my, uh, twenties and thirties at the time, the, the supplement market was, uh, was there were, there was a segment of the supplement market that wasn't regulated, or should I say, none of the supplement markets regulated, but there was a hormone segment. They used to call them pro-hormones that you could buy over the counter. In reality, many of these were designer steroids. Um, and what these supplement companies would do is they were able to look at the current regulation, skirt regulation by creating, um, you know, by, by, I should say, researching pharmaceutical companies' discarded anabolic steroid conceptions, bring them to market. They weren't technically illegal, but they were actually designer steroids. And so I used these throughout that, throughout that period, thinking I was using what's called a pro-hormone, something that wasn't an active steroid. Um, and so that probably caused some permanent depressions in my testosterone level as I hit closer to 40. So I used these in my, my 20s, maybe into my early 30s on and off, stopped using them. Once I started getting to my late 30s, I couldn't figure out why I had all these symptoms of low testosterone. Now, I didn't know it was low testosterone because my libido seemed to be okay, but it had all the other classic symptoms, low energy, uh, fat gain that seemed to be unexplained, uh, my strength and muscle was going down, um, anxiety, never had anxiety before, all of a sudden I was having uh, symptoms of anxiety. Uh, went and got my hormone levels tested and my total testosterone was in the floor and I had been leading a healthy life. So I knew, I mean, I could have raised my testosterone 50%, I still would have been low. So at that point, I had to make the decision to go on testosterone uh, replacement therapy. And that was just a total um, godsend. It was a game changer. I think Western medicine, for what it did, for what it can do, is, is a miracle. Uh, but most people uh, d won't encounter that. Most people's low testosterone can be remedied through lifestyle. I just happened to, I mean, uh, I took uh, hormones and hormone-like compounds that probably caused a permanent depression in my testosterone, which now I have to remedy through medical intervention. It sounds like when you started taking the medical intervention that things radically shifted for you. You mentioned it was a godsend. Yeah. Talk about that period when you started taking and how quickly you started to feel better and what that shift was like. Oh, within a month. Within a month, my energy was good. My anxiety disappeared. I felt like myself is, is the best way I, I could uh, describe it. So, you know, that's so, and that's like any, any, uh, deficiency that you have, um, that, uh, that needs medical intervention, like a vitamin or mineral deficiency, or, uh, let's say your thyroid is, is low and there's nothing, you know, you're, you're doing naturally that can, seems to work or help when you then supplement it, it's a, it's a life changer. So I just felt so different. It was like, oh, this is why I've been feeling like crap for the last three years. This is this is what's going on. But again, I didn't realize it at the time because my libido, low libido, sexual dysfunction is like the number one thing men will notice with low testosterone. 
but there are occasional cases like mine where I didn't necessarily notice that. Um, so I, I didn't look to testosterone to, to you know, find a reason or cause for my symptoms. By hearing your story, it sounds like at the time when you're taking these hormones, you didn't realize the negative effects they could have. And it sounds like they were, you know, accepted in the bodybuilding and well, resistance they, training world at the time. Yeah. One sec, what I'm getting at here is, is there anything people that you're seeing, you're obviously your ears to the ground and you're in this world. Is there anything new that people are taking that you could see turning out to be a negative thing that people are doing these days that they want to be on the lookout for? Yeah. So uh, again, um, you know, I would say I was willfully ignorant, uh, in those days. Um, I got into exercise because of body image issues, the whole self-hate thing that I talk about, you know, that's, I lived it. That's why I, I communicate it so often. Um, so yeah, I can, I mean, I, you, you know, when you took them, you could tell like, oh, this is doing something to me, but you know, it's over the counter. So it's fine. It was kind of my, my attitude. Obviously it wasn't fine. Today, you have a gray market for selective androgen receptor modulators or what are known as SARMs. These are chemicals that attach to the androgen receptor and act like testosterone and steroids, but are not testosterone and steroids. It's a gray market because they are not regulated for human consumption, or should I say they're legal for human consumption, but you could technically buy them online as research chemicals. So you have all these uh, you know, for lack of a better term, companies with no integrity that are selling them for research purposes, but they know what's happening. People are buying them and taking them and they have, we don't know what the effects are on the body. They're, they haven't been well studied. At the very least, we know that they have steroid-like effects. They depress your natural testosterone just like anabolics do. So I would avoid that. Plus it's unregulated. So you're not getting, you don't know what you're getting. Okay. So they could put whatever they want in the bottle. And uh, who knows? The peptide market is also very interesting. Now, peptides are remarkable and have some really remarkable potential health effects, good health effects in the body. But the unregulated gray market of research chemicals, we don't know. We don't know what they're putting in the bottle. Uh, if the peptide is off by a couple amino acids, who knows what it's telling your body to do? Um, you could now get peptides in a regulated way where they're coming from a compound pharmacy and you're working with a doctor, in which case I'd say, oh, that's fine. But there's a lot of people going to the gray markets online, getting these research chemicals and basically becoming experiments and not knowing and just kind of basing it off how they feel. Like, oh, I think it's working. I can feel it. Like, we don't know what you're getting, if it's dirty. Uh, you know, we don't know if there's additional amino acid chains attached to this that are making it do other things in the body. Who knows? So I would say watch out for that whole research chemical SARM peptide space. If you're going to work with hormones, work with a doctor. If you're going to work with peptides, work with a doctor. And then I would stay away from SARMs until they're regulated and prescribed and you're monitored by a doctor. Talk more about the peptides, because this is something I'm hearing more and more about in the health and wellness space. It's not something I've ever delved into the research to find out exactly what they are. So what are they and what are the positive ways that you're seeing people using them? Expand upon that some more. So peptides already exist in the body. Uh, now peptides loosely uh, refer to a long chain of amino acids. Technically growth hormone is a peptide. Okay. So that's the kind of loose umbrella term. But the peptides that are being being used therapeutically are uh, compounds that have been uh, identified in the body that signal the body to perform certain things. So like there are peptides that tell the body to amplify its healing and recovery process. There are peptides that tell your body to release more growth hormone. Um, there are peptides that tell the body to, to tan its skin. Um, there's all kinds of different peptides. Peptides that tell the body to uh, improve its glu glucose utilization, uptake more glucose, produce more energy. Now, what makes peptides unique is they're not drugs. So we're not forcing the body to have effects. 
we're using its all its already present signaling system, which means that what's also already present in the body are checks and balances. So I could take a growth hormone releasing peptide and it'll tell my body to release more growth hormone, but I will not release more growth hormone than my body would release naturally in optimal, in optimum, I should say, ways, right? So I may get my body to release growth hormone levels that would match what I did in my 20s, but I'm not going to go above that. I'm not going to be able to get my body to release so much growth hormone that it's like I'm taking bodybuilder doses of growth hormones. So that's what makes them uh, quite unique. Um, peptides are largely unpatented or unpatentable because of uh, their structure. Uh, now, I, I think that pharmaceutical companies are trying to find ways to lobby the FDA to be able to regulate because there's so much money that could potentially be made here if they could patent them. But for now, you could find peptide. You could go through a compound pharmacy. The compound pharmacy produces the peptide, and you get them for like really uh, low prices. So the margins aren't huge. This is why pharmaceutical companies aren't jumping all over them. But the ones that they can patent, they are jumping on. For example, GLP-1 agonists like semaglutide, also known as the trade name Ozempic, right? This is like the big fat loss drug that is like just exploding because people are seeing that they're losing weight on it. It suppresses their appetite. It's got great beneficial effects on the brain and all this other stuff. Uh, but you could also buy semaglutide, the generic version of Ozempic, go through a compound pharmacy, a doctor, and get it for far less than what you would do when when you go through the, I guess, the, the patented brand name of it. But yeah, that's the world of peptides. I've only really dived in deep the last year. With this, we did a great podcast with one of the lead doctors and researchers in that space, Dr. Seeds. So for anybody who wants to learn more, I would suggest checking out that episode. Pretty remarkable. My experience with peptides has been pretty amazing. Um, you know, I, uh, Mott C is a peptide that I used that had some profound effects, crazy energy effects, had some fat loss effects, um, you know, mood boosting effects. BPC-157, probably the most recommended peptide for the body, great for brain health, great for um, healing, injuries, recovery. Um, I, I love how that is making me feel. My gut health has had profound effects, positive effects from BPC-157. But there's, I think, like a thousand peptides. So this, this, this is kind of an emerging, I should say, space in terms of the mainstream. But peptide science and peptides themselves have been experimented with and used for decades now. You just mentioned the decade factor, but five, 10 years ago, was this something that you found people in your circle were experimenting with and talking about? To me, it seems just so new that at least in the mainstream, it's catching wind. It was it, it was fringe in my space in the sense that you saw biohackers using and talking about them. But like the Soviets, you know, they they were using peptides in for a long time and in, in using them as medicines um, for a long time. Um, you, you know, you saw some experiments here in the U.S. But again, because they you can't patent them um, under current. I guess, regulations, pharmaceutical companies have very little interest in pursuing them and the studies around them. But uh, they are quite remarkable. Um, I think, uh, you know, I would like to see more funding go the way of peptides so that we could start to see some, like, lots of human studies. But, I mean, like I said, they're they're pretty remarkable in, in their potential and their ability. And, again, I'll, I'll defer to, because this is not my expertise, I'll defer to the experts on this. But I, you know, like I said, the, the, I talked to Dr. Seeds, who's like, he's been researching these for a while and he's, uh, like one of the leading world's authorities on this. And, uh, based off of what he's saying, it's like, this, this is pretty cool stuff. It, they don't have the side effects that drugs do because you don't get this like receptor down regulation and all these other side effects. Cause you had to kind of shoehorn in a compound to affect particular receptors. You're, you're giving your body what it already uses to signal these functions. So it has its own natural checks and balances which inherently makes them a lot safer to use. You mentioned a Zempic. Is that actually a peptide? It sounds like it might be a little bit gray if it's actually under that umbrella. It is obviously a drug, but is it considered a peptide as well? It's a peptide, 100%. GLP-1 agonist, yeah. It's 100% a peptide. And how do you feel about that? That one's definitely caught a lot of mainstream media attention. And 
it works. You know, my my belief around things like that, because you'll take a Zempic and you'll lose weight, right? You'll lose, the data will show 10 to 20% of body weight without doing anything else, just taking that. It does suppress your appetite. It's probably one of the main, definitely one of the main ways it works. It also seems to rewire uh, behaviors around, compul- or should I say compulsive behaviors? So people will report that they don't want to smoke as much or drink as much um, or bite their nails or stuff like that. Um, but, you know, here's the problem. If you just eat less and you don't strength train and you don't monitor protein intake, then a significant portion of your weight loss will come from muscle. And you're not dealing with the root cause as to why you overeat, why you're inactive. So it's not by itself a great solution, but I do see it as a, as a good bridge. You know, the same way I would see antidepressant and anxiolytic use among people with, let's say, low levels of chronic depression, where they could use an antidepressant to kind of bridge between where they're at now to the behaviors that lead to better mental health, like activity, sunlight, better relationships. So I could see GLP-1 agonists being used as a way to like somebody who's really struggled, just has these impulsive eating behaviors, to use them in conjunction with exercise, diet, you know, strength training, and then slowly build up those disciplines and behaviors and then come off the, you know, come off the peptide type of deal. How do you feel about supplementing with amino acids? Just pivoting off of the peptide thing here. Yeah. That's a common supplement. And there is some controversy over, you know, supplementing with those and cancer. And how do you feel about all that? I mean, amino acids are just the building blocks of proteins. If your protein intake is low, or shall I say lower than what's considered optimal, but especially if it's low, like really low, right? So there's essential protein intake, which you need to survive. And then you can have a little bit more than that. uh, And then you can eat optimal, which is much higher. So optimal protein intake would be around 0.8 to one gram per pound of ideal body weight. Okay. So that's a lot of protein. If we eat below that, then certain amino acids can have some benefits, like branched amino acids or essential amino acids can have recovery benefits, performance benefits. But if you're eating adequate protein, it's a waste of money, complete waste of money. So like, it'd be like, I mean, you're eating if you're eating a gram of protein per pound of of, of um, ideal body weight, taking additional amino acids is totally a waste of money. And for somebody who benefits from taking amino acids because the protein intake is low. They'll get way more benefit from just eating more protein. So, you know, mixed, my opinion on amino acids is mixed. The people that I see benefit the most from amino acid supplementation are really strict vegans just because it's so hard for them to get adequate protein. That's where I see them benefit, the people that benefit from things like essential amino acid supplements where I'll have them take a vegan-based essential amino acid supplement with their meals to, to offset the fact that their protein intake is low. And for somebody that wants to supplement with more protein or amino acids, how do you compare, say, like a whey protein versus branched chain amino acids? I mean, a, a 10 grams of, of whey protein has more branched amino acids in it than your five branched amino acid pills. So you're better off having a scoop, a small scoop of protein. I mean, that's it. Fact. So the whole amino acid market is interesting to me uh, because just have more protein. That's, that's usually how I communicate it. Yeah, it was one, that's how I feel about it too. I was wondering if there was something else there I was missing. No, again, if your protein intake's low and it's hard for you to get more protein, then, and you want to just take a tablet, you know, a couple tablets, then yeah, you might get some benefit. But other than that, it's like, just eat more protein. And even, even a vegan, you know, my vegan clients, I would encourage them to take a scoop of vegan protein instead of taking amino acid tablets. All right. So obviously one of the foundations for the diet you recommend is getting a lot of protein. Yes. We've talked a lot about resistance training and why that's important for somebody that's going to incorporate that or is incorporating that and they want to get the diet piece right. Other than protein, what else do they need to consider? I mean, honestly, if you hit your protein in target and you prioritize that, meaning you eat that first in the meal. So let's say you're, you're, ideal body weight is 150 pounds. So you're aiming for hundred and between 130 to 150 grams of protein a day. Okay. And let's, that would mean that every meal that you have should have between 40 to 50 grams of protein in it. And you ate that first, that alone for most people will result in fat loss. 
because protein is extremely satiety inducing in comparison to carbohydrates and fats. You'll eat less without even trying. And then the muscle building effects uh, that that induces in combination with strength training and the metabolism boost. But if you wanted to add something else, the other one I would do is avoid heavily processed foods. So protein, avoid heavily processed foods. Most people would get pretty close within range of what they would consider to be a healthy body weight just from doing those two things consistently. That's it. Nothing else. Okay. So for somebody that's going to take on incorporating more protein, the first thing we talked about there, and they're thinking about doing that through, say, a shake, like a whey protein adjunct to their meal, to you, how does that differ between having, say, like a steak? Yeah. When it comes to being satiating and beyond. Yeah. Protein shakes are the processed food version of protein. So the satiety effects of a protein shake are not anywhere close to the satiety effects of protein found in food. Even if you account for the macro, some people will be like, well, yeah, steak also has fat in it, whatever, fine. Eat chicken breast, dry, right? Like almost no fat, pure protein. Eat a 30 gram protein chicken breast and 30 gram whey shake. See which one affects your appetite more strongly, right? So um, yeah, no, I, I, protein shakes are good for one reason and one reason only. At the end of the day, if you miss your protein targets, then you add it as an emergency supplement. Other than that, whole foods. Otherwise, you're gonna be missing out on the benefits that I'm talking about. When it comes to fat loss in a classic sense, for most people, I think when they think of that, they go right to cardio and pushing their body, running, biking, whatever it is, where they're getting their heart rate up and pushing it for an extended period of time. What I love about your book is right at the beginning, you debunk that myth and, and you get into the fact that this is not a good method for losing fat and actually might have the opposite effect. So I want to start here and talk about why this is. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, the data is quite clear on this. When you try to exercise fat loss uh, or exercise fat off your body through a cal calorie burn process, it's actually a, uh, a failing strategy. And the, and the data shows this quite clearly. Now, as a trainer... Uh, a coach and a gym owner. Uh, and I've been doing this for over two and a half decades. We saw this all the time. It just it just didn't work. Um, but I do understand why people approach exercise this way and why it's been communicated to us this way. And it really boils down to how the body burns body fat. And then what we did is we took that understanding, which was really a simplified understanding, and then we valued exercise based off of that, and uh, we just had the wrong conclusion. So let me let me explain that first, and then we'll get into why cardiovascular activity on its own is really not a great uh, method when it comes to uh, fat loss, when it comes to exercise. So we know, and we've known for a long time, that fat loss happens from what's known as an energy imbalance, okay? So you take in this many calories, and if your body burns this many calories or more calories then you have to make up the calorie difference somewhere. And so you end up with weight loss and preferably fat loss. Okay. And that's true. That's a, that's a, a fact. It's um, a law of thermodynamics, um, law of physics. The only problem is, is we took this, this understanding, this model, and then we took the, the calorie out side of this equation, the calorie burn side of the equation. And we said, okay, uh, we need to burn more calories. Let's look at all the different forms of exercise and let's value them based off of their calorie burn. Because if we're trying to fight obesity and we're trying to, you know, battle all of these chronic health conditions that are connected to obesity, and there is quite a bit, and we are in this epidemic of chronic health issues, then it, it makes sense that, okay, let's pick the form of exercise that just burns the most calories. And when you look at exercise this way, it's clear that cardiovascular exercise is superior in that sense. You will burn more calories per time being spent running or cycling or swimming than you will doing, you know, Pilates, yoga, and, and even strength training, which is what I talk about. Um, now, the problem with this is that we ignore the most important factor when it comes to exercise, which is how does this form of exercise get my body to adapt? And then what do those adaptations mean? What do those adaptations do uh, for my body? And because we've ignored that, we've run into some, some big problems. So with cardiovascular activity, it does burn a lot of calories while you're doing the activity. But first, let's talk about that for a second. It's not that much. So even though it burns a lot of calories in comparison to other forms of exercise, 
it's still not a ton. In an, an hour of really vigorous, challenging cardiovascular activity, for the average person, will burn maybe four to five hundred calories. And I know that there's cardio machines out there that'll say, you know, you burn a thousand calories during an hour, or eight hundred calories. Those machines are lying to you. Um, they they do that to get you to want to use their piece of equipment at the gym uh, in gyms like this because they can, they get popular. But really, on average, you're looking at four to five hundred calories. And that's not a ton, especially if you only work out three days a week. Um, it's really easy to eat 400 calories. It's really hard to burn it manually. So there's that problem. Then we look at the adaptations that cardiovascular activity induces on the body. So it burns a lot of calories while you do it. It requires a lot of stamina and endurance, and it requires very little strength. Okay, this is true. So if you look at uh, top endurance athletes, what you'll find is they all they have very little muscle and strength on the frames. And that's because the kind of fitness that you need to perform long, steady state forms of cardiovascular activity really require a, a machine. And when I say machine, I mean the human body. They require a machine that is efficient, a machine that burns few calories and uh, requires uh, very little energy. Because remember, your body, through exercise, adapts in ways to get better at whatever stress you put upon it. Okay, so to use an analogy, imagine if we had a super advanced uh, AI car that adapted its engine, it, it adapted the way it looked to your driving habits. So now imagine you drive, um, you know, 200 miles every day at 30 miles an hour. So that would be like, you know, cardiovascular activity, just, just constant, long, you know, trip with your car at, at a slow speed. Well, your car would turn into a very fuel efficient not very powerful car because it's trying to conserve energy. And this is what happens with lots of cardiovascular activity. So you actually at first will burn a lot of calories, but then your body learns how to burn less calories. And, and part of this process by, is by paring muscle down. Because you don't need a lot of strength uh, when you perform this form of exercise and because your body's trying to become efficient, it actually pairs muscle down. And because muscle is very expensive, it's like the, the big engine of the body. It, it, it burns a lot of calories, at least it requires a lot of calories to maintain. So when you look at studies on uh, lots of cardio plus diet, what you end up seeing with the weight loss is a significant portion of the weight loss is coming from muscle. Um, and some studies will show almost half. So you lose 10 pounds, five pounds of that is muscle, five pounds of that is body fat. And the end result of that is you are a smaller similar body fat percentage that you were before version of yourself uh, that now burns less calories. And this is why this approach tends to look like this. And a lot of people have experience with this, right? They, they start cutting their calories. They start eating less. They start doing you know more running, more cycling, whatever. And they get that initial weight loss that happens. And then they hit this kind of hard plateau. And they're like, okay, well, I lost that first 12 pounds. And now I'm stuck. I've got 25 more pounds to go. What do I do? Um, well, I guess I got to eat less, or I guess I got to do more exercise. And so then they do that, and then they get another seven pounds of weight loss, and then they plateau again. And so they go down this path, and they end up in this unsustainable place where they're like, okay, I hit my goal of my 30-pound weight loss, but man, I'm not eating very much, and I got to I gotta go on a 30-minute, 45-minute run five or six days a week. And that's really hard to maintain for the average person. The average person is not a, a fitness fanatic. The average person doesn't love exercise the way I do. You know, I love it so much I made it my profession. For the average person, exercise really is a tool to improve the quality of their life, okay? So if it takes up a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, and if you combine that simultaneously with the fact that now I got to eat very little, and of course, modern life, really we're surrounded by easily accessible, hyper palatable food, and we do lots of things with food, we celebrate with food, and um, boy, that's a very, very tough position to be in. And it's no wonder diet and exercise approaches have, you know, almost a 90% fail rate, right? So, um, you know, I, I say this in the book as well. We don't really have a weight loss problem. We have a keep weight off problem. I mean, every year, millions and millions of Americans lose weight, but they all gain it back. So, you know, we, we all tend to fail at the, how do I keep this off? Right. And a part of that problem is that, that unsustainable approach. So what I talk about in the book is something that I've applied over the last, you know, two decades of training people and managing gyms, which is a much more sustainable approach. So what I do is I viewed exercise and I said, okay, 
forget the calorie burn because that's such a manual work intensive uh, form of calorie burn. Can we teach the body to burn more calories on its own? Can I take this person and give them a faster metabolism? So rather than burning, you know, three, four, 500 calories only while they exercise for an hour, can I get that person's body to burn that on its own every day? So every single day, can I get them to burn that many more calories? And the answer is yes, you can do that. And the process of doing that involves strength training. So why? Why does that happen with strength training? Well, strength training, although it doesn't burn a ton of calories, at least traditional strength training doesn't burn a ton of calories while you do it, what it does is it it tells the body, we need muscle, we need strength, and we don't need an efficient metabolism. We just need muscle and strength. That's the most important thing. So go ahead and burn more calories to provide this for us. So again, to go back to the analogy of the AI adaptive car, if I took that same car that adapted to my driving habits, and instead of driving 200 miles uh, a day at 30 miles an hour, I drove you know, 15 miles as fast as I possibly could every day, well, my car would morph itself into this V10 twin turbo, almost like dragster type car where it, it just burns a ton of fuel, but that's okay because what it's trying to do is get me 15 miles as fast as possible. This is what happens to the body when you build strength and build muscle. You actually teach your body to burn more calories. And so what weight loss looks like and with strength training at the focus or at the at the center is the weight loss starts off a little slower. And, and that's primarily because the weight loss that you experience through strength training is fat. It's pure fat. And, and oftentimes, especially when you first get started, there's a simultaneous gaining of muscle. So although the scale may look like you only lost a couple pounds, you probably lost five pounds of body fat and gained three or four pounds of muscle. So the scale may show eh, a little bit of weight loss or maybe no weight loss at all at first. In reality, you have lost body fat. You've just gained some muscle. And, and side note on that, muscle is denser than body fat. Okay. So 10 pounds of body fat takes up more space, takes up roughly three fourths, uh, uh, or uh, body, I, say, I should say, yes, muscle takes up roughly three fourths the space that body fat does for the same weight. So if everybody lost 10 pounds of body fat, but gained 10 pounds of muscle, they would lose close to a quarter of the size uh, that they have on their body. Okay. So you're still going to get smaller, just the scale might not reflect it at first. But now that you've got that extra three pounds of muscle, your body is burning more calories on its own just to support that muscle. But also through that muscle building signal, your body says, we don't need to be so efficient with calories. So you start to get this snowball effect with fat loss, where it starts off a bit slow, and then your calories, your, your metabolism kicks in, you start to burn more calories on your own, and then the fat loss happens faster and faster and faster. And then you end up in this much more sustainable place where you're eating more than you did when you started. And this, I've had this happen countless times, where I'll take a client who needs to lose 30 pounds, and through this uh, method at the end of our weight loss journey, they're actually eating more than they did when they first started. So you can eat more and you're only exercising, and we can get to this as well, two or three days a week uh, because uh, proper strength training uh, in this context doesn't require a lot. Two or three days a week and the average person can get significant metabolism boosting effects. So now you're working out two or three days a week, you're eating as much or more than you did before, and now you're in this place where it's much more sustainable. Now I can enjoy dinner with my wife uh, on the weekend, or we can go on vacation. Um, I can eat more food. I don't have to work out every single day if I don't want to. And now my quality of life has improved. And I have this, uh, this, this approach that is just much more sustainable in the context uh, of modern life. And I think a good analogy to explain what you just brought to light there is having money invested in the bank and working for you versus when you're doing cardio, you mentioned you are burning calories during that activity, but it's not having that effect afterwards, like if you're putting on muscle. So putting on muscles, like putting money in the bank, letting it work for you when you're not directly working and having that going on in the background. Absolutely. And there's a lot, there's, there's so much more that goes into this. Okay. So one of the things I like to communicate with strength training mainly because it's such a such a great selling point and I think people um, 
they want what I'm about to talk about, and I think they get it, is that strength training directly promotes a youthful hormone profile. Okay, so directly. No other form of exercise does this. Now, to be clear, improving your health will do this anyway, generally. So just getting healthier tends to make whatever hormone profile you have become more quote unquote youthful. What does that mean? Higher uh, testosterone levels in men or more bioavailable testosterone, a better balance of estrogen and progesterone in women, better growth hormone levels, cortisol that's appropriate, right? That rises in the morning to wake you up and drops at night so you don't have this high cortisol all day long, this stress hormone. You become um, you have more insulin sensitivity, meaning you need less insulin to uh, elicit the same effects. And, you know, insulin insensitivity, I mean, that's what leads to so many health problems, including uh, obvious, the obvious ones like diabetes, but things like uh, cognitive decline, dementia, and Alzheimer's. Um, so improving your health will do that, but strength training does it directly, okay? Literally does it directly. So how does that work? What, why is it that it does, this, does it this way? Well, when you send a signal to the body that says we need muscle, we need strength. One of the things your body does to do this is it organizes its hormones in a way to do so because the hormones are the, the signal messengers of the body, okay? So if your body is saying we need more muscle, it doesn't just build more muscle. It takes the muscle building hormones and it boosts them a little bit. It takes the muscle wasting hormones and it controls them a little bit. So what are those muscle boosting hormones? Testosterone. Testosterone in men and women is a pro muscle, pro youth hormone. Now I know some women are like, what do you mean? You know, testosterone is a male hormone. Yes, men have higher levels of testosterone, but it's just as important in women as it, as it is in men. In fact, low testosterone in women causes the same negative side effects in women as it does in men. So low drive, low libido, low energy, increased anxiety, um, all the things that a man will experience with low testosterone, a woman will, will experience with low testosterone. By the way, men have estrogen as well, just lower levels. We also need healthy estrogen levels as well, just to kind of balance out this, uh, this conversation. But, but your body will raise testosterone. It'll also increase the availability of androgen receptors. So these are, these are the receptors that testosterone attaches to. So what you see is this androgen receptor density improvement through strength training, very direct effect. Your growth hormone levels become more youthful because growth hormone does play a role in the muscle building and repair process. Um, insulin, you become more sensitive to insulin. In fact, uh, studies will show that the most effective way, one of the most effective ways to improve insulin sensitivity is just to gain a little bit of muscle. I mean, they, they've had studies done on the severely obese and they don't even have them lose weight. They just gain a little bit of muscle. And you see these improvements in insulin sensitivity, mainly because uh, muscle is one of the ways that we store glycogen. This is a type of energy that comes from carbohydrates and sugars. So if you have greater stores for glycogen, you're now not dealing with this issue where sugars and carbohydrates can cause insulin insensitivity, or at least not as much, right? So you get this insulin sensitizing effect. Cortisol becomes more appropriate, right? Because cortisol gives us energy, so it tends to spike in the morning, but cortisol that's high all the time, it gets rid of muscle and it promotes fat storage. Um, now, not to go too deep into the weeds, but the, the prevailing theory is that, you know, for most of human history, when we were stressed chronically, it was probably due to food shortage. That was really probably, otherwise stress was quite acute. Like, oh no, there's a, a lion, get away, now we're safe. But the kind of stress that you experience that's chronic was probably due to, I can't get enough food. We can't find enough food. And so what cortisol can do is it actually can pare down muscle. Why would it do that? Uh, because it's like, okay, well, we're not getting enough food. Let's start burning less calories. And let's also promote fat storage so that whatever calories we do eat will store more efficiently. Okay. So the muscle building process tends to cause the opposite, right? So my, my body's like, I need to build muscle. Oh, we got to lower cortisol a little bit uh, or make it more appropriate, I should say, to make that happen. So strength training has this direct effect on hormones that makes, it, that makes it more like the hormone profile we had when we were in our late teens and early 20s, okay? And that feels good. 
It feels very good. It also encourages behaviors that lead to fat loss, that lead to movement, that lead to productivity, okay? Because when you're a man or a woman and your hormones are imbalanced and you have uh, hormones that don't that aren't more towards that that youth profile, you're more stressed. Your behaviors tend to be more sedentary because your body's like, relax, don't burn any calories, please don't move. You tend to have cravings because your body's turning up its, its your, your, your behaviors to eat food, especially foods that are hyper palatable, ones that bring you comfort. So you'll find that you're more uh, attracted to foods that have sugars, salts, fats, those type of things, that combination of foods. Um, so this is a, a very, very um, important effect that strength training has on the body. And no other form of exercise has been shown to do this. The other forms of exercise can improve hormone profiles, but that's through just improving your health. Strength training literally directly does this, literally. So you start working. In fact, if you go, you take the average person and you have them do, you know, five sets of a traditional strength training exercise, like a squat or a push up, you actually see an immediate boost in testosterone. You see an immediate boost in growth hormone. You see an immediate improvement in insulin sensitivity. No other form of exercise has been shown to do this uh, at nearly the same rate. There's another whole period of time when your health dipped at age 31, you started having gut issues and things started to go awry. Take us back there and talk about what happened and then we'll get into what you did to come out of it. Yeah, so you know, I, I, I like many fitness, um, I don't know, experts or professionals, I should say, people who get who make fitness their career. Many of us are initially motivated uh, to work out and become obsessed with exercise because of some kind of body image issue, or 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 we develop a dysfunctional relationship with exercise and diet. So you'll see more eating disorders in the fitness space than you will in the average uh, population. Okay, that's just a fact. So, and I was no exception. I, I, I abused my body and I was excellent with other people. I trained clients very well. It's like doctors, you know, they're, they're way better with their patients than they are with themselves. Trainers are just like that. And, um, I did a good job with them and I was really concerned with their health and I would really try to help them in the best ways possible. But with myself, it was just, it was all about, um, pushing my body and, looking a particular way, ignoring my body's signals. Well, at 31, my body rebelled. I developed severe gut health issues, lost about close to 15 pounds of lean body mass and couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. At one point I thought I might have Crohn's disease. It was really bad. Um, and so I had to abandon all my old methods and adopt the methods of some of the people that I worked with in my studio who were wellness oriented. Um, and I did gut testing. Um, I dramatically lowered the intensity of my workouts. I stopped weighing myself, stopped looking in the mirror as much because I was quite triggering and really just chased health, really chased vitality and health. And it completely changed and shifted my relationship with exercise. And now it's still, it's always in the back of my head, but it really did change uh, my approach and it really molded the voice that I have now on my podcast, which is what I speak to all the time. But that was a year-long process. It was a year-long process. At the end of it, the irony is I looked better than I had looked before. And that's when I realized fully that that whole aesthetic goal, you know, that I was always after really was just a side effect of good health. What I was looking for was health. I was looking for the side effect of good health. And so I thought to myself, why not just be healthy? That'll make me look the way I want. And so uh, it was, it was a, a, a blessing in disguise, I should say. And is this a lesson you had to learn time and time again in the coming years, or you've been pretty good since that hitting the wall there? You know, the big lesson was there. Okay. But, uh, there's always that. I mean, I love it. I love the gym. I also love performance. I love maximum strength. I love pushing my body. I love experimenting with supplements, uh, now, you know, with peptides. Um, so it's, it's a constant battle because my, you know, I'd say most people's battle is just getting consistent, right? Just getting consistent. My battle is doing too much and eating in ways that push performance beyond health. So it is a constant check and balance for myself. Um, I do find that um, 
the podcast helps a lot because I communicate very, you know, I can be very objective and genuine, um, and, uh, you know, authentic when I'm helping other people, um, to myself, I can always be quite deceiving, but it, it, you know, it's a mirror, right? So if I'm talking to people constantly and helping people, then uh, there's definitely moments where I'm like, I should probably take my own advice, you know? (laughs) Peptides aside, you mentioned you like to do different experiments. What experiments are you currently conducting? Oh, well, I mean, the peptides are the big one right now. Um, I'm using the BPC-157. I did MOTC. Uh, C-MAX, which uh, is a nootropic, it, it, it increases BDNF in the brain. That's uh, been pretty cool. And then supplements, I mean, God, you name it. I mean, there isn't a supplement in the world that I, I don't think I've tried um, to, to some extent. Um, so, I mean, you know, I like playing with the different effects and noticing how they affect my my body, my mental health, my mental clarity, energy, sleep. I mean, it's just, it's just a, it it definitely, it's definitely beneficial from a standpoint where I can talk about these things from personal experience, but uh, I'm pretty well aware that I'm, you know, I definitely step outside of what's good for me oftentimes when I, when I do these things. Test the boundaries and then find the middle. Yeah, it's more like go beyond the boundaries and then bring back, you know, especially with, I got an, I got a good wife that checks and it it really puts a check on me sometimes. There you go. And we've talked extensively now about diet and and resistance training, but what about other health and wellness modalities that you incorporate into your routine? Things that come to mind, you know, sauna, cold plunge, have a lot of momentum in the health and wellness space. Are you into any of that or others in that realm? Sleep is the biggest one. Uh, so, um, going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time is a big deal. That makes a huge deal. Making sure you get seven to eight hours of sleep, big deal. That'll have profound effects on most people's health. Okay. Besides that, you mentioned the sauna. Sauna's got some great benefits. Uh, steam room, you could probably put in that category. Um, but you know, besides that, the one that I, uh, I don't know, just didn't look at or value for the longest time, which now, and it's ironic because the data all points to its profound effects on health alone, not just mental health, but physical health, is a spiritual practice. Spiritual practice, will sh- I mean, the data is very clear on this. People who have a very consistent spiritual religious practice, they, they have significant lower rates, significantly lower rates of all-cause mortality cancer, heart disease, uh, you name it, mental health, much better, better relationships. They tend to be better parents. They tend to be better partners. They suffer from divorce rates at lower rates and anxiety and depression at lower rates. Um, so there's definitely something there. So, I mean, without even getting into the esoteric, you know, um, side of it or any of that, it's just, look, look at the data. The data is clear. A spiritual practice is essential for health in humans. It's fact, end of story. It's indisputable. So if you are somebody that's into, that is trying to improve the quality of your life, then you can't ignore the fact that this is something that has a significant impact. So you look at it and there's lots of different ways to do it, but I'd say look at it. Can you talk about what that looks like for you? Uh, yeah, I'm a Christian now. I was an atheist for a long time. And, um, you know, once I opened up to the the wisdom of the Christian faith. Um, I started becoming a Christian and practicing and, uh, it's, um, I mean, it's had profound benefits on, as on me as a father, as a husband, um, uh, it's provided a deeper sense of meaning, uh, behind what I do. Uh, it helps a lot with some of my own challenges. Um, you know, so it's, uh, but that's, that's, I mean, I, I guess, the, the, the long and short of it is, uh, you know, I, I am pursuing, I should say, the Christian faith more, faith, more specifically Catholic. And for you making that transition, you mentioned atheist to Christian. Did that come at a time of need, a time of challenge for you? Um, I mean, looking back, sure. Uh, but really what it was is um, I opened up to the possibility of the wisdom that was present uh, in the Judeo-Christian uh, traditions. So when I was an atheist, it was all about denying all of it. And then when I started to really realize the um, 
how it shaped culture, how it drove some of the things that we take for granted now uh, in society and the wisdom that just is present there. I said, okay, there's wisdom here. There is wisdom here. And I need, I should be open to the wisdom alone. Forget the metaphysical aspect. Okay. I can still think that there's no God or any of that stuff, but I should, I'm, I'm going to be stupid if I don't look here and see that there's genuine wisdom and I should open up to that. Once I did that, then I started opening to everything else. And of course, at some point you come to the, the, the leap of faith, right? At some point, then you, you start to struggle with that. Um, and you have to either make that leap or not. Um, and that's eventually what got me there, but it was initially just opening up to the wisdom. Cause if you look at the, I mean, just, the, 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 and here's an easy example. Okay. Free societies. Okay. Societies that value, uh, the rights of the individual. That is so counterintuitive. It's not even funny. That makes no intuitive sense for all of human history. It was, I'm bigger and stronger and I'll get what I want. I have more power than you. You do what I say. That's how humans have always lived. And then we created these systems and they weren't expressed perfectly and they still aren't, but they drive us to progress in this direction. Like who would have thought, right? That you're going to design a government that protects individual liberties. Where the hell did that come from? This is during a time of Kings and Queens and all kinds of crazy stuff. And you had people saying, no, 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 we, we want to do this. Where'd they get that idea? It came from the Judeo-Christian faith. So that's a crazy wisdom that isn't intuitive. Uh, I don't think we should take that for granted. So um, that that was one of the ways that I, I said, okay, there's something here. Let me, let me open my mind up a little bit to this potential wisdom. And then when I did, it was like, wow, oh my gosh, they said that? How did they know? How do they know all these different things? That's so crazy. So, And how long has that journey been for you, the religious piece? It's been at least four years, maybe three or four years. And I'm assuming maybe the religion ties into this, but when it comes to stress management, do you have like a meditation practice? Certain things you're doing, obviously exercise is a stress management tool in and of itself, but exercise, religion aside, anything else in that pillar under that category? Um, yeah. Uh, spending time with my family, focusing on being present is a big one. You know, my stress, and I would I would assume most people's stress can revolve around um, not being here now. So it's like I'm thinking about the past, or I'm anxious about something in the future. You know, meanwhile I'm sitting here, and everything's okay. Everything's kind of cool. Or I'm sitting with my kids, and like I'm missing out on what's happening now. There was a good book that I read um, years ago that was on the beginning of my spiritual journey, I would say, it was uh, Eckhart Tolle, A New Earth. And he talks a lot about um, being present. And that is like, I mean, if you could really master this and, and work on this, the you find that when you become really, really present, your stress melts away. As we talk about this whole mindset piece and the mind and you know religion, everything we're getting into right here, it gets me thinking about the name Mind Pump Media. Yeah. Talk about the origin there and how the mind ties into that whole brand. Well, when we started the, the show, uh, my co-host and I uh, have been in the space for you know two and a half decades, and uh, we knew that fitness would be a a cornerstone of our conversations. But we didn't want to pigeonhole ourselves because, luckily, we had done it for so long that we realized that realized that health encompasses life. It's everything, right? So. It's not just exercise and diet. It's also mental health. It's relationships. It's family relationships and friend relationships. It's spiritual uh, health and how we frame things. Uh, and so we wanted a podcast that where the name didn't necessarily because you know you end up pigeonholing yourself if it's like you know fitness pump or muscle build or whatever, right? We wanted something that allowed us to talk about lots of different things. We also knew as trainers that. A lot of our success revolved around our abilities to make uh, the experience enjoyable for our clients, which meant a lot of our conversations had nothing to do with fitness. Like people showed up and they liked hanging out with us while we trained them. So a big part of our show is not fitness. We talk about current events. We talk about family life. We talk about, you know, things that we, that, that are funny to us. Um, it's the entertainment piece. And I mean, 
uh, I mean, full disclosure, we're trying to attract as many people as possible so that they could start to hear what we have to say about health and fitness. And one of the best ways to do that is also make it entertaining. So when you listen to some of our most popular episodes, you know, the first half of the show is, you know, very little to do with fitness, but we know that that attracts more people. For somebody on their own health and wellness journey, tuning into this point, and, you know, they've heard, again, us get into the fitness piece, the diet piece, and now this whole mindset religion piece. What are some of the other pieces that they need to make sure they're at least looking at to make sure they're getting the foundation in the health realm as a whole? Well, I mean, generally you can, because that's a, that's a lot of things. Um, cause you, you know, we mentioned the big ones, right? But you have a relationship with, uh, all of your behaviors. Okay. And if you can take an honest look at certain ways that you are and certain things that you do, and if you can honestly say to yourself, this is less than ideal, this isn't really healthy, then there's something there that you should look at. So this could be your financial health. You know, you could you could look at your bank account and be like, I know I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Do I need to be living this? Of course, there's times when that's just the way it is, but there's lots of times where, you know, you know, why do I why do I spend money on things I don't necessarily need, or are there ways I could spend money that are going to be more fulfilling? Um, you have a relationship with traffic. You have a relationship with being on time or other types of stress. I think you could look at different things and say to yourself, you know, I don't necessarily, you know, let's look at it like something some, something simple, right? Like coffee. Right? Everybody wakes up, a lot of people like to wake up in the morning and have coffee. If the thought of not having coffee in the morning is just terrifying, well, there might be something there you want to look at, right? What is it? Is it the caffeine? Well, what if I give you a caffeine pill? Are you going to be still as upset? Oh, you are? Well, maybe there's something about the coffee. I don't know. I don't know, right? So, uh, I mean, this is this is obviously taking inventory, but, um, uh, you know, this is kind of, this is after you've tackled those big rocks, you could do that and say, you know, I, you know, I feel uncomfortable sitting alone with my teenage kids. I don't feel like I can bond with them. Well, let's take a look at that. You know, maybe, maybe there's something there that you can, you can work on. And it usually has to do with something with yourself. So it sounds like the first step when it comes to improving, take that inventory of your life, be really honest with yourself where you're at, and then you can work from there. Totally. Totally. If you're willing, because the first step is just ad 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 admitting, but admitting doesn't mean you have to do something. And the reason why I say that is I think sometimes people will not admit because they feel like they have to take action. That's okay. You can look at something and say, well, you know, I don't got the best relationship with this particular behavior. I'm not ready to tackle it yet, but I'm going to admit the fact that, that I, it's not a great relationship. And that's okay. That's a good step. You've touched on family. And one of the big pillars in the health and wellness space for a lot of people is community. How do you look at that when it comes to maintaining that within your own health and wellness routine? Well, I mean, you're the people you hang out with and associate yourself with, um, they will influence you and they will bring certain things out in you, right? So if you have a friend who you and them connect really only when you guys drink, then if you try and stop drinking, it's gonna be really hard to maintain that relationship with that person. And that relationship may dissolve as a result. And that's okay because you're doing something, you know, that's that you need to do or whatever. So in, in, in the context of, of health and fitness, you know, I seek out and foster relationships with people that, uh, that prioritize, I'll say, or, or lead lives with health and fitness that you think might help you, right? Like if you're going to go out and eat with, the, with a group of people, it's going to be much easier to do so when you're eating with people who also prioritize eating healthy. You're not going to feel so much like you're sticking out. The temptation isn't going to be there as much. And you're not going to get the grief. You know, if, you, if you've ever, a lot of people I'm sure this will resonate with. It's like you change your diet to try and eat healthy. Then you go out with your friends, they all eat unhealthy. And now you're like, no thanks. And then, you know, it's a mirror, right? So it reflects upon them. And so now they're making you feel weird about it. Well, who cares? What's the big deal? All oh, this stupid diet, just enjoy your type of deal. And that can make it tough. That, could, that can create a wedge. So 
I would say, you know, seek out people and foster relationships with people that'll help you move in the direction you want to move. It makes a huge difference. A big part of our message today was fitness, resistance training. We've given people the reason why to do it, reasons, and we've given people the basics to get started if they haven't already. What would you say to the person right now who is, again, tuned into this point and they're on the fence? Maybe they've tried to adopt a, a resistance training routine in the past and they've dropped it. What would you say to them to make sure that they're taking this seriously and giving them the inspiration to get started? Yeah. Um, take one step. And the way you determine what that step is, is make sure that it's a step that's somewhat challenging because otherwise it's not going to have any meaning. So it has to have some challenge, right? But ask yourself if this is something that you feel like you can maintain for the rest of your life. That's the step you take. And there is no wrong answer. So it can be, I'm going to drink an extra glass of water a day. It could be, I'm going to walk for five minutes on Mondays. It could be, I'm going to do one squat every morning when I wake up. Like it doesn't matter what that step is. So long as it's somewhat challenging, but also realistic forever. Just start there. And then when it becomes a behavior, then ask yourself again what the next step is. And what'll happen is each step tends to get a little bigger and the gap in between steps starts to get shor shorter. So this, this is a snowball effect, but that's it. That's where you start. Now I, I do have a, a book that people can read that really helps and allows it gives people some, somewhat, some more structure. It's called the Resistance Training Revolution, and in there I kind of talk about, you know, kind of how to get the ball rolling, and I give you some structure if you need a little more structure. You can also on YouTube our, our channel, the Mind Pump channel, we have one that's all exercise oriented. There's lots of exercises and demos if you need more help. Um, but what I said is really it. It's like take that first step, stick with it. When it becomes a behavior, take the next step, and that's it. So say it's a Monday, somebody goes and does a resistance training full body workout. Let's talk about over the course of that day, plus the days following, what happens in the body just to give people a better idea in general, plus how they might want to structure that second and third workout, spacing it out wise. Yeah. So remember, you are sending a signal to your body to adapt. That's what's happening with your workout. So the workout itself is the signal. The adaptation, the muscle building, the hormone balancing, the metabolism boosting, the fat loss, all happens after through the adaptation process. So then the question is, how do I effectively send the signal with my workout? Well, first off, and most important, this is most important, that signal needs to be appropriate for you, for your body, your fitness level. It must be appropriate. It's like a bell curve when we're looking at exercise or strength training in particular. Too low of a dose doesn't send that signal. The right dose sends the most effective signal. Too much, your body can't deal with it and can't handle it, okay? Because there's two simultaneous things that are happening, and they do cross over quite a bit. One is healing, which is recovering. The other is adaptation, and they are separate. And the reason why I communicate it this way is because people think healing is ad adapting. It's not. What you don't want to do is get stuck in this hamster wheel of beat myself up with my workout, get sore, soreness goes away, beat myself up with my workout, get sore, soreness goes away. Meanwhile, no improvements. Meanwhile, my strength's not going up. I'm not getting better technique or form. I don't feel better. I'm not building muscle. I'm not boosting my metabolism. Why? Because all you're doing is breaking down and healing. The dose is not appropriate. It was too much for you. And most people, especially when they first start training, do too much. They just go too much. So to use another adaptation process of the body, uh, our, our skin's ability to tan or darken when exposed to the ultraviolet rays of the sun isn't a form of adaptation. Okay. So if you've been living in your basement for five years and then you go outside, it doesn't take much to get your skin to start to darken. What happens if you stay in the sun too long? You're going to burn. You get a sunburn. You get a sunburn. You don't tan any faster. In fact, now what has to happen is your skin has to heal 
and you got to wait for that heat, that sunburn to go away, and then you got to try again. You don't get there any faster. The fast, the, the fastest way to get that skin to darken is to have the right dose. Now that dose will change as your skin darkens. Okay, just like the dose with your workouts will change as you become more fit. How do we change the dose? Uh, I lift more weight. I did 50 pounds on the squat. Now I can do 55 pounds, right? Or I do more reps or I do a more challenging exercise, right? These are all ways. And there's a long way to go with that. Like I can go real far with that before ever having to add more days of exercise to my workouts. So, so now someone may be, may be wondering, well, what does that feel like? Like, I don't know what that feels like. Like I, my idea of exercise is I got to sweat. I got to crawl out of the gym. That's how it's effective. No, no, and no. First off, you should feel better after your workout than you did going into your workout within that same day. So if, if, if you don't leave your workout feeling more energy, feeling more mobile, feeling better overall, not satisfied because you just beat yourself up, not that cathartic feeling of, yay, I just punished myself, but rather I objectively feel more energy and feel better. That's a good sign. Okay. If the day after you're really sore to the touch, you went too hard. In fact, you should feel either no soreness or the kind of soreness you need to search for, where you need to kind of stretch, be like, oh, I think I'm a little sore. That's appropriate. Too much soreness is a sign that you did too much. It's a terrible sign of a good workout. People often think if I get real sore, it means I had a good workout. No, if you get real sore, it means you did too much. And now you, you're, you're, your body's not able to adapt. Uh, the way that it needs to. Um, third thing, all movement, all forms of exercise at its core are skills. Okay. It's a skill. So I, there's a story I like to tell that really, I remember when this really hit me, um, when I really had this epiphany, I was hiking up in the hills here up in Northern California. I have some beautiful trails and I was up there hiking and, you know, on a weekend and I do that sometimes. And Every once in a while, a runner would pass me by, right? So they, they, a jogger would just kind of run by me. Now, being somebody who's worked with biomechanics and the human body and training people for a long time, it's very hard for me not to notice biomechanics and movement whenever people are doing something around me. It's just, you know, it's something I love. So as, as people are walking, running by me, I notice, oh my gosh, that person's feet are pronating really bad. That's going to hurt the inside of their knee eventually, or, ooh, that's a really strong anterior pelvic tilt, or man, that person's got this asymmetrical shift or whatever, right? And so I'm just noticing as people running by, like, oh, this, these people are hurting their bodies. They're not, this doesn't look good. And then this, this gentleman ran by and he, I mean, he looked like a gazelle. He was just gliding and flying by me. And I said, wow, that is beautiful. That is great. And then I thought about running and I thought, man, you know, of all of the physical activities that, that humans can do, there's only a few that we can do better than almost any other animal. One of them is throw with accuracy. Like you, you take a five-year-old and they could throw with better accuracy than any animal. And the other one is just to out-trek any animal. This is actually how we hunted for thousands of years. We would wound an animal and then run after it until it got tired and then we would kill it. So we have this tremendous capacity for, for being able to do this. And I thought, gosh, if we evolved to do this, why do we suck so bad at it? Why are so many people running by with terrible technique and form? And I said, oh, it's because we stop running when we're 12. And then we pick it up again when we're 30 because we want to lose weight. And then we don't view it as a skill. We look at it and we say, uh, I'm going to do this until I get tired. Like one of, the, one of the, the biggest skill and technique killers with any skill is fatigue. If you're trying to learn how to shoot an arrow or you're trying to learn – how to throw a basketball into a hoop, or I don't care what skill you're trying to learn. What you don't want to do is do it when you're extremely fatigued and, and out of breath. You, you, it just technique goes out the window and your body reverts to its old movement patterns. And then I thought, you know what? People treat all forms of exercise this way. They don't think to themselves, I'm going to go to the gym today and perfect the skill of squatting, which is a fundamental human skill, right? They don't think to themselves, I'm going to go perfect the skill of overhead pressing or rowing or twisting, right? Or lunging, which are all fundamental human movements. 
what we think to ourselves is I'm going to go to the gym and beat up my legs. I'm going to go to the gym and hammer my shoulders. I'm going to go to the gym and sweat and get sore. And so we never develop the skill of exercise, which means we never derive the true benefit and value. Because if you look at all exercises, if we were to give them a score of 100, perfect technique and perfect form and skill, you would get 100 out of 100 in terms of derived value. Terrible form and technique, you would get far less. In fact, you would actually get negative benefit because you would hurt yourself or you could hurt yourself, right? So I like to tell people, and this is, I, I remember when I changed my approach with clients and it was like, the results people got blew away what people got before. And, and it's when I said this, when you go to the gym, I don't want you to work out anymore. I want you to practice. I want you to go to the gym and I listed these exercises for you. And I want you to practice the skill of these exercises. I want you to get really good at squatting. I want you to get really, really good at rowing. I want you to get really good at pressing. I want you to get really good at lunging or whatever exercises that I would put on the list. Perfect the skill. And what this led to was people train more appropriately because when their technique and form was off, they would lighten the load or reduce the intensity. So it kept their intensity appropriate because as you become more fit, you can push yourself harder and harder and still maintain perfect technique and form. People, they injured themselves far less, and they started to derive tremendous value from these incredible exercises. So that's those three things that we like to tell people. More energy, more energy after you work out than before. You should not feel sore, or if you do, it's the kind of soreness you need to search for to feel. And then the last one is practice your exercises. Don't work out. And that those three things tend to lead people in the right amount, the appropriate amount of exercise in that sweet spot where the body adapts rather consistently. And as you share that, it gets me thinking of a couple of things. One being we've classically been taught to take our reps, well, within a set to push it to fatigue. And what you're saying is that's way too much. And two, this ties to something you say in the book where when we treat it like a skill and we're working at our form, that can be more hard to do if we're in a gym setting with all kinds of other people because, you know, you want to put on the most amount of weight and yeah. you see the guy over there with with all these plates when he's doing his squat and you don't want to be the guy that just has the bar and he's working on his form. Yeah. So those two things come to mind. So you have to be humble and realize you're in the long game here. You're working on your skill. And two, throw that idea out the window that you need to go to fatigue because that's pushing your body way too hard. It is. And, you know, it's funny. People are probably listening, going, well, you know, but what about when you're advanced or what about, look, the, the, the intensity needs to be appropriate. And if you're advanced, uh, to get your body to further progress does require a much higher level of intensity and load. Um, and the training needs to be different, but even in those populations, they've done studies on, uh, on people who are advanced on training, what's called to failure, meaning lifting a weight until they can't lift it anymore versus people who stop maybe two or three repetitions short of failure, okay? So high intensity, but still, they're not going to failure. What do they find? And these are advanced athletes. Not going to failure results in more consistent results, okay? So it's just too much intensity for anybody, even for advanced athletes. Now, the average person needs to bring it down even more than that. And like I said, need to focus on, the, on perfecting the technique and skill, feeling better after the workout, and not getting sore. And that'll lead you in the right direction. And it'll get you to naturally ratchet up the kind of workout that you do. You know, there's this belief that that workouts need to be grueling, grinding, painful, crazy sessions in order to be effective. This is super false. And the root of this, the there's two roots. There's, there's a few roots to this. One of them is the glorification of the workout martyr. Uh, and a lot of this, remember a lot of the information we get in our health space comes from unhealthy people. So I'll, I'll go into that for a second here. If you want to go into a space with a lot of eating disorders, with a lot of body image issues, with a lot of poor health, go into the fitness space. Okay. More people have eating disorders and body image issues in the fitness space than almost any other space, probably rivaling the fashion model industry. 
Okay. This is true. I work in it. I know. You talk to any trainer, anybody who works in gyms, they'll tell you, oh yeah, that's totally true. Now what they've done is through their obsession, their orthorexia, is they've accomplished a body that looks a particular way. It doesn't last very long, but it looks a particular way. So we think that they know what they're talking about. We take their advice and these are fitness obsessed. And so what they do is they communicate through that lens. You got to go crazy. It's got to be beast mode. You got to go super hard. You know, the uh, pain is weakness leaving the body and all that stuff, right? Now that's combined with the real root problem with these issues, which is people go into exercise and diet from a place of self-hate. Okay. The average person, right? They, they, they pick up a, a dumbbell or they get on a treadmill or they start to reduce their calories because they look in the mirror or they see a picture or they feel a particular way, or there was a comment somebody said, and they say to themselves, I'm fat, uh, I'm gross, I'm, in, I'm inadequate, I'm not sexy, I'm not attractive. I mean, we can make a whole list of things people say to themselves. I, am, I, I gotta go work out, and I gotta cut my calories, or I gotta watch my diet. And that place of self-hate is very motivating in the short term. In the short term, it's very motivating. This is why it's so cathartic for people when they first start working out to beat the crap out of themselves. This is why they'll sign up for a class where they're drenched in sweat, crawling out of the class, legs shaking. They go lay on the couch and they're like, ah, oh, that was a great workout. Well, yeah, it, it feels cathartic because you hate yourself. You deserve it, right? That's what you think in your head. I deserve that punishment, right? Food becomes restrictive. You know, you, they go to a friend's house and the friend offers them a slice of pizza. What do they say? I can't have that. I can't have that. I'm on a diet. What do you mean you can't have that? You can have whatever you want. What happened here? Well, you're, you're, you've turned yourself into the, the, the child that requires the oppressive adult to tell them what they can and can't do. And so now, right now you're the, you're the adult telling yourself you can't have that slice of pizza. Sorry, can't have that. What eventually happens though? Eventually. You stop hating, your, you, you can't hate yourself forever, right? So what do you do? How many times have you heard this? You know, I stopped working out. I stopped that stupid diet because I just want to enjoy my life. Like what? What do you mean you want to enjoy your life? The truth is nothing will improve the quality of your life, all of the qualities of your life, like improving your health. So why is it that we say I stopped working out and I stopped dieting because I want to enjoy my life? Well, it's because exercise was a punishment and because good nutrition was restrictive. So instead, what we need to do is we need to enter into it from a completely different standpoint. We need to say to ourselves, I, uh, I, need, I, I deserve to be taken care of. I need to take care of myself like somebody that I care about. I deserve better health. And you can be honest with yourself and you can say, I haven't been doing that. Yeah, I have... 30 pounds of extra body fat on my body. I don't feel good. I haven't been taking care of myself, but now I'm going to start. So now what does exercise turn into? Self-care. Now I go to the gym because I'm here to take care of me. What does diet become? Self-care. So now it becomes, hey, do you want the slice of pizza? And you say, no, thanks. I don't want it. Or you say, sure, I'll have a slice, right? But what you don't have is the rebellion at the end of a diet that looks like this. Yes, I'll have that slice of pizza. In fact, give me the whole pizza. I'm going to eat the whole thing. And I'm going to eat until I can't breathe anymore and feel uncomfortable. <laughs> right? So if we go into it from that standpoint of self-care, you will develop over time a different relationship with exercise, a different relationship with nutrition, one that feels good, one that is sustainable forever. Because when you get that relationship, you don't need motivation. It's just, this is what I do because I take care of myself and I enjoy it. And yes, it's still a discipline and we could talk about how to build that discipline over time, but it is no longer a white knuckling, you know, got to do this and grind and I got to just, I got to fight those urges and I got to, oh my God, nobody can live like that for the rest of their life. Forget about it. It's, it's, a, it's a losing strategy. Now that you're done with Sal, you're going to want to head over here and catch my chat with Dr. Lyon. She's got a lot more to share about burning fat and building muscle. You don't want to miss this. I'll see you over there. All these metabolic dysfunctions, we put on obesity when in fact we should put on skeletal muscle.